to see if he's here. I'm sure he will join us. So I will open this meeting of the MBA. Uh, the time is four, four o'clock. Present are commissioners, Mary McGann, Evan Clapper, Sarah Stock, Gabriel Wojtek, Jacques Hadler, Tricia Dean. I still don't see Kevin. Okay. Uh, uh, we have Quinn Hall, our clerk auditor, Chris Baird, commissioner uh, administrator, Mallory Nassau, uh, associate uh, commission administrator, and is Tara on the phone, on the call? Tara is not married, but I believe Kevin um, just joined. Oh, and Kevin uh, Walker. Uh, we will begin this meeting of the Municipal uh, Building Authority. First order of business is approving minutes uh, from January 5th, 2021. Do I have a motion? I move to approve the minutes of January 5th, 2000. Okay. Thank you, Jacques. Motion by uh, Jacques Hadler. Do I have a second? I'll second that, Mary. Thank you, Trish. Uh, motion by Jacques Hadler, uh, seconded by Trish Shadine. Do we have discussion? Okay. I'll call for a vote. All in favor? of the motion to approve the minutes from January 5th. Uh, say aye or raise your hand. Aye. aye. All aye. Anyone opposed? Uh, a motion passes unanimously. We are now to approving access easement agreement for the 540 five, five, five East 100 North Moab, Utah. Chris Baird, Commission Administrator. So we've, uh, we need to, the city is requesting that we record a shared access for our project up there because it spans, or the access spans um, two different parcels that we both, um, Grand County does. So this is going to be a two-part process. Um, the MBA version is just giving the nod or its approval for, for recording that easement. However, uh, when we get to the uh, commission session, regular meeting, there's another agenda item where we actually approve the easement and the recordation of that easement. So we're, we're kind of covering two bases here. Because there's a ground lease associated with that project from the county to the MBA, we're just having the MBA give its approval for uh, the county to go ahead and record that easement. Questions? I'd make a motion. Thank you, Gabriel. I move to approve the access easement across county property known as 580 East 100 North to provide deeded access to county property known as 540 East 100 North. Motion by Gabriel Wojtek. Do I have a second? I'll second, second that. Second by Kevin Walker. Uh, discussion? I'll call for a vote. All in favor of the motion, say aye or raise your hand or both. Aye. Everyone opposed. Passes unanimously. We are at the end of our agenda. We've completed our agenda. If no one objects, I will adjourn this meeting. This meeting of the Municipal uh, Building Authority has been completed and adjourned. We will now move to our regular meeting of the Grand County Commission. Present are commissioners, Mary McGann, Evan Clapper, Kevin Walker, Sarah Stocks, Gabriel Wojtek, uh, Jacques Hadler, Tricia Dean, Clerk Auditor, uh, Quinn Hall, Chris Baird, uh, Commission Administrator, 
Mallory Nassau Associate Commission Administrator. Uh, first order, uh, we uh, will have citizens to be heard at this point. Are there any citizens to be heard? Mallory? I'm seeing somebody on um, with the last four digits ending in 6742. Are you on for public comment? Uh, press start. I am. Unmute. Okay. Yes, I am. Okay, state your name. Uh, we like to keep the uh, comments to around three minutes if possible. So thank you. Okay. What's your name? Uh, this is Michael Atkinson, longtime resident of uh, Moab City, Grand County. Um, I am calling to reference the uh, draft minutes that uh, received on Friday concerning item Q of the last county commission meeting uh, pertaining to the uh, Moab UMTRA uh, project in which I did send in an email earlier in the day. Unfortunately, it was too late for a good review and an understanding of that email in that it was perceived by some of the commission that I was asking for that additional money should be asked for in the resolution. I am totally understanding that the resolution that was put forth by the commission was not to be any way a dollar amount attributed to it, but it was going to be put in with a resolution by David Hinkins that was then going to go to the governor's office, which was then going to down to all the down river people saying that it was going to be forty seven thousand forty nine forty seven million forty nine million uh, to for a period of uh, till two thousand and twenty five when in fact it could be uh, $600 million, and it could go out to 2036 per the latest uh, draft request for proposal. My point in that email was mainly that with the local DOE people saying that we could cut a lot of years off of that and do much better, it was actually that I was thinking that it, the amount could be reduced. And as far as... Um, the commissioner that did not completely read and understand the email saying that maybe he doesn't understand that, yeah, it's going to cost more money if you're not getting more tons. Spending 30 years in the mining industry, I know exactly what incremental tons can do. And on this project, our incremental tons, from $35 million being funded tax dollars to $45 million, we are doubling the amount of tons that that project is moving. So from an incremental basis, we're moving 100% more tons for $10, million more, for $10 million more dollars. And finally, the chairwoman calling me out about being critical, you said it three times, and you also said I, you can ask Quinn – he nitpicks at everything I do. I take great offense to that, Madam Chair, and I would like an apology. And if you, if you approve those minutes as a commission, the way they're written, they do not record what was said during that time on that recording at 3 hours, 17 minutes, and 34 seconds. Thank you very much. I apologize, Michael. Are there any I know, other? Mary, I know. I know that you don't have to say anything back to the citizen that is that is saying, but I, I appreciate that. But please, yes, please uh, read over those. Please read over those minutes before they're approved. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Are there any other commissioners to be heard? I mean, not commissioners to be heard. Are there any other citizens to be heard? I don't believe so, Mary. It looks like everybody um, who is on is on for um, an agenda item at this time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We are now to uh, approval of minutes for the January 15th 
new commission orientation and the January 19th regular county commission meeting. Do I have a motion to approve those minutes? I move that we approve those minutes. Okay, uh, Kevin moved that we approve the minutes of January 15th and January 19th of 2021. Do I have a second? A second. Seconded by Gabriel Wojtek, discussion? Madam Chair? Yes. I would, I would make a substitute, substitute motion to postpone the approval of the last meeting's minutes uh, to review comments regarding the UMTRA resolution. So is that a substitute motion? Yes. Okay. Substitute motion by uh, Gabriel, uh, Evan Clapper to only approve the minutes from the January 15th, 2021. Uh, do I have a second for the substitute motion? I'll second that, Mary. In that motion, I'm, I'm, uh, I believe we vote on the substitute motion, correct? First? Okay. I, any discussion on the substitute motion? It's, okay. So we're, we're, only, we're only approving the 15th right now. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, well, I, I just, the word UMTRA only appears once in them. Do we know that there's an issue with the minutes that can't be fixed right now or? Uh, if, if you're ready to fix them right now, but um, uh, I did not review them <clears throat> regarding the citizen comments. We just heard that closely. And so. Um, yeah, maybe I missed, I mean, the, I looked for the word UMTRA in the minutes and it occurs only once. In, a, in an innocuous way, but maybe it's, there's something else in there. I don't know. If, you, if you're more comfortable waiting, that, that's fine. My motion stands. Okay, motion to uh, approve the, only the January, sorry, January 15th, uh, minutes. Uh, any further discussion? Okay. Uh, all in favor Aye. of the substitute motion? All of, okay. All in favor passes unanimously. We will postpone the January 19th minutes until next meeting. In. Hey, Mary, Mary, tell me who seconded that again, Evan. Tell me who seconded Evan's substitute motion, please. Trish. I think Trish. 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 Thank you. Trish. I better start writing that down. I was doing that better last week. Okay, we are now to uh, ratification of payment of bills. Do I have a motion? Chair? Yes. If I may, I, I would make a motion to approve Grand County bills for February 2nd, 2021. Total bills in the amount of $1,069,564.45. Total payroll in the amount of $236,835.65. Total bills and payroll in the amount of $1,306,400.10. Motion by Gabriel Wojtek. Do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Jock Hadler. Okay. I learned uh, in our budget, in our commission workshop or orientation that we do not have to have a roll call vote on this. So all in favor of approving, ratifying the bills, say aye, raise your hand. Aye. Anyone opposed? Aye. All in favor? It passes unanimously. Thank you. We are to uh, commission uh, disclosures. 
Do we have any commissioners that need to disclose anything on this agenda for anything on this agenda? I don't okay. know if it's uh, appropriate here, but I will disclose that my annual disclosure form is uh, late um, I, with uh, trying to get that stamp. So the, you mean get the rat, uh, get the notary. 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 You can go to uh, Desert Rivers Credit Union. They do it for free. Okay. Okay. And um, I, I don't know whether that's appropriate either, but I'm in the same boat as Evan on, in terms of getting things notarized. So. Cost $5 at uh, the copy center. So I'm sure. going to make sure yeah. I always go to Desert Rivers from now on. <laughs> Okay, anyone else? The sheriff's office to go right up to the desk there. I've, I've used that before. Uh, are they open now? For When I went there, they were still closed. Good point. Sorry, that was pre-COVID. Yeah, it's pre-COVID. Okay. Now, we are now to general commission's reports and future considerations. Uh, let's start with Evan. I just muted myself back. Uh, let me pull up my notes here. I guess I'll start with uh, future considerations while I pull up my notes. Um, I think that we've seen a flood of uh, emails today uh, regarding um, the Red Rock four wheelers deciding that uh, uh, not to hold the um, Easter Jeep Easter. Safari within our COVID stipulations. And the county attorney had a good response to uh, one individual. And I would say maybe uh, in the meantime, while we continue to work on this, um, that maybe we use that, uh, kind of tweak that into like a a general response to the flood that's coming into the commission email box because um, it's to the point that it's uh, hard to respond to all those and that seemed like a good uh, response that was well worded and um, that's just something to consider. Um, let's see. We just uh, did the um, the EMS right away in our previous meeting. I did meet with uh, Arches Special Service District and uh, there's some new members that were appointed um, late last year and they're doing a great job of kind of moving the ball forward. And um, uh, we are currently working on scheduling a public hearing for a budget. Um, so that the, those uh, pub privately held assets can be passed over to the special service district. And um, besides that, I've just kind of been trying to tune in to uh, some of these legislative updates um, when possible. And uh, I believe that's all I got to report. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sarah? Um, I attended the Moab Area Watershed Partnership meeting. We covered a lot of stuff there. There's um, <laughs> the, the MOP signed onto a letter in support of the Forest Service, the, the Manti LaSalle National Forest Plan that um, has been written. And then there's also a, there's a proposed um, fire reduction project up in the Manti LaSalle National Forest on Harpole Mesa, which is historically sagebrush habitat, but has been encroached with pinion and juniper. Um, so it's being considered for categorical, categorical exclusion, which means no NEPA process. Um, the MOP partners generally seem to be supportive of this project. It's a mosaic cutting project, leaving old trees behind. And we had discussed in that meeting with the Forest Service representatives about um, reducing the diameter of the trees 
that were left. So um, there might be a few more trees. Um, there's also this ongoing discussion on efforts in Spanish Valley to quantify the groundwater resources. And I encourage anyone who's curious about this to tune into the next MOP meeting, which will be, oh, I think it's the third Wednesday in March, um, because we'll, we'll be having a state of the science discussion where we dig into a bunch of the new um, research that's been done. And one big question what, that we're trying to understand is if, there, if there's additional groundwater development in the Spanish Valley, how will it affect this brine layer that lays underneath the Matheson wetlands and part of town? Will that brine layer encroach, interact with the wetlands in different ways? So if you're interested in that, um, tune in and I'll report back on it also. That's, a, that's about it. Thank you, Sarah. Trisha, Hadeen? Um, let me do that. Thanks, Mary. Um, so I went to a couple meetings on the 21st. Um, I went to Thompson Springs where we talked more about a Thompson Springs cleanup. We've mentioned this a little bit. It's obviously been a fairly long lapse in community cleanup efforts since basically Bob Sanitation became Monument. And so we're looking at how to get Monument back out there. They're not real invested if they don't have accounts out there. So we're looking at that. The overall goal is to reduce the fuel load in Thompson, specifically to reduce, you know, house fires. Um, Orion did just a general statistic and basically that community, it's like a thousand times more likely to, to have house fires or the fires that they've had in the, the past number of years is like a thousand times above kind of the just basic standards. So it's pretty bad. Um, we are looking at having a public meeting and I'll just lump this really quick. We're going to start with just a public meeting that's going to take place on February 9th via Zoom and just kind of, you know, dip our toes in this concept of like what that might entail and how invested is the community in that. Um, I met with the Grand Water and Sewer, that special service dis district. As you know, we've had dreadful snowpack this year. Um, they are looking at purchasing a lease um, off of Frank Darcy on a well needed basically for irrigation backup and drought situations. They are doing well monitoring to make sure that that aquifer is not being depleted farther by these additional wells. And um, yeah, so that's, that's basically what I pulled out of that. And then on the 25th, I went to the planning commission. I do want to state that I did that in route to somewhere. So I, I missed components of it. So I want to state that. But basically, there is an uptick in permitting. Um, as always, there was that mention of, try, you know, lack of affordable housing. There was a presentation by SITLA that was slightly discouraging in the sense that the area north of town, they have approximately 9,000 acres out there and they were looking at their viability as far as development. And, you know, when they are looking at that, they're looking at stormwater drainage, visibility, topography, utilities. They mentioned the concept of if they were to develop, it would be cluster develop, development. Um, and that's when Josie chimed in and mentioned that, you know, there was, via that survey, there was overwhelming public sentiment as to the opposition of developing that area. Sitla did reiterate that they are mandated by the state to develop state lands, um, but they did admit that they also have not looked into water or water availability in that area. And like I said, unfortunately, I did miss a portion of that meeting, but as you saw uh, Mila presented us with a really nice presentation on planning and zoning to kind of bring us all up to speed on that process. And then, yeah, that was basically it. Um, my big push is really working currently with Thompson and trying to get that community, you know, just a little safer working on fire mitigation and cleanup out there. That's it, Mary. Well, thank you very okay. much. You're welcome. Was when can I ask you a question about the Sitla uh, meeting? With, uh, I know at one time I thought it was north of where they're building the 
university that they were going to build some uh, dorms and things like that. Mm -hmm. Is that what they were referring to or was it a different? Piece? No, I'm referring out kind of just more north of town in that 313 area. That was basically oh. the area. Oh. But I can, I can, you know, speak to Josie and, and make sure that I am correct about that. Yeah. Okay. Thank but you. It, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Gabriel. Yeah. So um, let's see. Um, I attended a rural economic development meeting hosted by the Six County Infrastructure Coalition. Um, there were some uh, uh, commissioner commissioner representatives from the um, from our regions, uh, counties. Watkins and Albrecht were in attendance, um, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, you know, based on the fact that they're so busy right now in legislative session to get them to for an hour in a meeting like this. And there was mainly the emphasis was the lobby for increased supports um, to AOGs um, and to create re a, sort of a regional economic development coalition and, and, and push the state for incentives for a regional approach to economic development, which I think is a wor worthwhile conversation. And I think uh, Grand County could have a lot to gain from that type of approach. And I think it could help us work with our neighboring counties rather than a, um, opportunity to work with them rather than against them. And I think that that's a great thing. Um, so it'll be interesting to see where that conversation um, could go. I've been attending um, the USAC uh, legislative committee. I don't know if that's the correct way to, to call it. It's just a kind of legislative yeah, legislative meetings. They're on Wednesdays from nine to 10. I believe we all get invitations for them. I think they're kind of interesting. It's kind of a Zoom call with a hundred people on them and they're, they're just calling out bills and getting people's takes on them. And um, I, I've been sort of sitting in on those and I find, um, find that to be pretty interesting. USAC, I believe is Utah State Association of County Commissions. There's one third C in there. I'm not exactly sure. It's one of those acronyms. Um, Four Corners Behavioral Health meeting last Tuesday, that was the 26th. Um, this Moab City granted Four Corners a one-year building permit exemption for the Moab facility. Um, so they're just kind of um, stretching that out a little bit, um, but they did complete sort of demolition and clearing of that space, but it's still kind of on hold. Uh, Four Corners Behavioral Health staff has been vaccinated, at least those, um, those who uh, chose to receive it. Um, there, there was a presentation on the on the day in the life of a crisis worker, um, and I thought it was a really uh, interesting perspective, an um, important perspective about the needs of needs um, here in our county uh, with regards to mental health, and sort of getting a a, a, a snapshot of what a crisis worker, um, you know, what they might see in in a 24 to 48 hour period, and how many hours they're putting in, going from case to case, all you know. All you know, without almost without rest, it's it's it was pretty eye opening. Um, right after that, uh, Southeastern Utah Health Department um, Health Department is considering accreditation. Uh, that's mainly just to improve quality and processes for the health department. Um, there's some costs associated with that, but it's kind of an interesting development, I think. Um, tier one and vaccinations should be wrapped up this week, including K to 12 staff. And I did receive a message from Brady Bradford. I asked him for a quick update on how the second vaccine dosing is going because yesterday marked sort of the first day that they were scheduling in uh, folk, the second dose from folks that got their first, so people getting the booster or whatever you might call it. And so they had um, 160 due yesterday and another 240 today. I didn't get an update on today, but more than 150 of those um, that were scheduled for their second dose um, showed up and a few that had conflicts that communicated about it. And so uh, Brady was really encouraged by that, um, that, that level, that percentage of participation. Um, and um, the second dose has resulted in 12 to 36 hours worth of headache, chills, mild fever, fatigue, and about 25% of second dose recipients uh, in a, and, and um, a very tender injection site and many others. Um, so I'm sure that um, you know, we'll, may, we'll probably set up potentially another update from Brady at, at our next meeting and get a little bit more um, information about how that is uh, coming along and if we're uh, vaulting into the next tier of vaccination. Um, 
And uh, I have I attended uh, the first um, AOG meeting as an official member, um, formalized the formation of the Southeastern Utah Community Action Partnership, which is a nonprofit supported by the AOG. Uh, their mission is uh, Southeast Utah leads, strengthens, and supports the community action network by working with community stakeholders to advocate for vulnerable populations, build thriving communities, and end poverty. So it seems like a worthwhile organization. Um, it'll be uh, interesting to see how that how they can be active in Grand County. Um, otherwise, that um, you know, economic development is definitely the hot topic in that um, on that board. Um, it's definitely an interesting board to sit on in terms of. You know, I sit on it along with Mayor Emily um, and sort of a, a lot of the conversation, um, you know, tends to revolve, especially when we have um, Senator reports from Romney and Lee's office and a lot of conversation um, sort of, uh, you know, and I, I might say, you know, ranting about uh, what's going on at the federal level and kind of uh, just kind of being quiet and waiting for opportunities more to talk about where we can sort of partner with these other counties or in these other sort of governmental organizations rather than sort of talk about where we might have a different stance. Um, so it's an interesting little dance, I would say. Um, but just, yeah, emphasizing that we're partners in PILT, um, partners in building infrastructure in our region, um, and also just kind of still pushing that idea of developing OHV recreation opportunities and Emory and Carbon um, to help alleviate some of our congestion. I think that that's something that will uh, that I'll continue to key on um, in that group. Um, I had a follow-up interview with USU Extension about sort of their continued hiring process that's still in play. Um, and they're gonna give us an opportunity to in interview candidates, um, but it's good to be involved, continually involved in that um, process. And then the Grand County Economic Development Advisory Board, I sat in on that last Thursday, uh, still $24,000 left of SB 95 funding. Um, currently exploring the possibility of um, directing that funding towards uh, the development of a child care facility. Um, I will, I will, uh, I will leave it at that. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> You've been busy, Gabriel. Thank you for all your work. Uh, Jacques? Uh, yeah. Um, I attended the Museum of Moab uh, board meeting. There is discussion of how to attract a uh, greater diversity on the board and uh, more community outreach, attract a, a wider demographic. Um, people interested in the museum. Also, the uh, 2021 uh, budget was discussed and approved at that meeting. Um, also, uh, attended the Chamber of Commerce meeting. Um, and uh, Let's see, that was, uh, there, was a, there was a great presentation on the Lions Back Resort by John Dwight there um, that increased my understanding of that. Uh, and looks like that's gonna, um, the phase one is, is, is proceeding with the Lions Back. Also, a, they discussed a, there was a discussion on uh, having chamber representation on the economic diversity board that we'll be voting on later today. They would like a seat at the table at that. I think a couple of the members from the chamber are applicants there. Um, and, uh, and then the annual chamber uh, retreat date and place were discussed as well. Uh, and it looks like it'll probably be on the 2nd of March, unless that changes. Um, I was not able to attend the Recreation Special Service District meeting as I was out of town and that was an in-person meeting, but I did uh, get in contact with Marsha and I'll attend future meetings there. And I was able to uh, uh, have a, a quick meeting with them, um, with BIGA, actually just set up a meeting with, with BIGA from the Film Commission. So I'll be doing that uh, in a couple of days. That's about it. Thank you. Once for again, very busy. Uh, Kevin? Um, so let's see. Uh, in the past two weeks, um, some discussions with redistricting consultants. That's an agenda item later on. Um, there's a meeting with the state director, along with Mary and others, state director of the BLM, excuse me. Um, had a meeting with Elaine Gisler about the data that she collects, and she'll be talking about that later very soon in the agenda. 
um, and some discussions with a, a noise consultant, with someone who writes local noise ordinances to get ideas for what Moab City and Grand County might be able to do. Um, and some discussions with Moab City officials about approaches we might take using the land use code to regulate UTV rentals and how the city and county can coordinate on that. And then finally, there's you know, been quite a bit of activity as you would expect this time of year on the legislative subcommittee. Um, and um, I won't go into particular bills, but that, that was um, a pretty big mail volume working on those things. That is all I have. Thank you. Uh, I had my this is this was my busy time of the month. I uh, attended the housing authority uh, meeting, and uh, they're considering doing some affordable housing in the Pat Creek campground area. Uh, the Walnut Lane uh, eight units will be delivered mid June, and the people who will be first uh, uh, opportunity to move into them are the families that are living in uh, trailers which are considered uninhabitable. So it's nice to know that people are going to be in, in safer conditions. Uh, there is a 50 people wait on the uh, cinema courts, which is huge. And MAPS is completely full and Virginia is completely full too with some waiting lists. We have the Solid Waste uh, Special uh, Service District meeting. Uh, well, a whole bunch was talked about. I'm going to only focus on one. They are going to, they're starting a community recycle center sponsorship to encourage people that use that to uh, help uh, with the fact that recycling does not pay for itself. So they're asking people you can, uh, be a sponsor for anywhere as a as a resident. You can be a sponsor from twenty five dollars to five hundred dollars, depending on your desire to support uh, sort separated recycling. Uh, on uh, and then the commercial uh, sort separated is a hundred to a thousand. They tend to just do cardboard. Uh, BOM. Uh, as Kevin mentioned, we had a meeting with the state director, Greg uh, Sheehan, and uh, district, um, Mr. Torres, and Moab's uh, Nicole, Nicole White. It was uh, successful and unsuccessful in both in, in many ways. It, I think we did make some gains in ways we can start to protect our backcountry and help with the problems that we're facing in Moab. Uh, the UMTRA project, the, the tailings committee, uh, the operations continued with, uh, continues. There are four trains per week. Uh, on October, they moved 86 million tons, or 86, yeah. Uh, in November, it was 74, not million, uh, thousand, excuse me. And in December, it was 76 and they have moved 70% of the pile. Uh, total, uh, there is more than, there's more than 11.2 million total ton, tons moved. So that's very exciting. Uh, I attended the airport meeting. They're working on sign replacements. Uh, they're uh, February's uh, flights will be at 315 and they will arrive in Denver at 345. There was a missing aircraft, but it was found near Mineral Bottoms. Uh, the plane lost few, was out of fuel, but they landed safely. Uh, and they talked a lot about their solar panels that they want to uh, install and work on. And so for a future consideration and for the staff, one thing I'd like to look into, it will open up many opportunities for grants if Grand County, like the city of Moab, belong to the blue sky, uh, uh, you know, Rocky Mountains blue sky, where we buy part of our, uh, from renewables. So I would like that as, as a future consideration. Thank you. 
We are now to uh, elected officials report. I see Christina, do you have anything? I will do a couple of quick updates. Um, this is the third year of my term and the first time I'm trying to keep up with general session, which is completely overwhelming. And I know a few of you guys are dabbling in that, so I'm sure you can uh, relate. But I have been working a lot with the legislative committee with Chris Baird and with our new private lobbyist, Casey. And so that's been um, a lot of work, but really good. Um, and I do think we are you know, making some headway on TRT. I'm sure Chris will speak more to that because he's been really involved in that one. Um, I'll speak to one ATV bill we have seen that we were able to successfully get a tweak that uh, relates to street legal ATVs later. But I wanna make the point, cause I'm in a legislative committee with both the county attorney group this year for the first time, but also UAC. And this year, both of those groups are really facilitating well participation uh, in the process by Zoom. And I have to say, I've been quite impressed with UX process so far. Now, unfortunately, they don't seem to be indicating that they have any interest in doing this into the future. And I think that they'll still revert back to all these in-person legislative committee meetings in the future. Although I hope that as time goes on and they see how successful it is getting some of the commissioners and county attorneys from some of the more rural and remote um, counties participating that they'll keep it up. But I do just want to give that feedback that I've been really impressed with UX process. Um, they have it set up where they do these polls of members and you can just weigh in on every single bill. They'll do updates, they'll do debates for and against, um, and then every single member gets a chance to vote. So I think that that's been really helpful and it's information that is really helpful for us to take to um, our legislators. And it, because they're voting on every single bill, it's not something that is realistic that they can send us a um, you know, an update. I mean, we're talking hundreds of bills. I think they've even estimated a thousand bills this general session. So I do think it's important we're participating in, in those types of big UAC meetings to the extent they continue to do this um, via Zoom. And so that you're tuning into the bills you care about and you note the votes on the bills you care about and you can use that information with your lobby, your uh, legislators. I'm certainly doing that. Those are every Thursday morning at 10. I think you guys are getting the same links that I am. So I do encourage you to check that out if you guys have extra time. Um, uh, Chris might speak to this as well, but today's been a day of chaos over all these rumors circling with Jeep Safari. The county has not canceled this event. The county did not deny their special event. I just went to the Facebook page to see what the latest is that they've been posting and Red Rock Four Wheelers themselves posted that the Grand County Health Department denied the permit. There is no actual Grand County Health Department. I assume they mean the Southeastern Utah Health Department. I did contact Orion to confirm whether there was a denial I was unaware of. And he confirmed that the SUED has not denied any um, permit either. We're gonna be meeting with the organizers to find out what's going on. But in this public forum, I just wanna reemphasize that Grand County has not denied this permit. Um, we were processing the permit. Uh, we even had gotten very few questions from Red Rock four-wheelers four um, about the process this year. So it came as a surprise to us, but we are working on it. Uh, and that is it from me. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Christina. Uh, I just wanted to say I've been working really hard on the uh, Utah Raptor State Park. And... Uh, I now, uh, because of that, I'm working closely with SITLA to find a way to get them to do something other than to charge for the Willow Springs because it's making the bill too expensive. Right. Quinn Hall, do you have anything to report? Um, not really. I've been sitting in on some of the UAC meetings and the clerk auditors uh, meetings on Thursdays discussing the legislative initiatives. There's a few things that are concerning to the clerk auditors. Um, there's some rank choice voting bills that we're generally opposed to for myriad reasons. Um, there's some other property tax deferrals. That, anyway, we'll talk about those later. Chris Coffin has looped in on them. Other than that, it's business as usual. We're cruising along. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any other elected officials on the call? 
Okay, we are to our uh, county administrator's report. Chris? Chris Baird? Mary, if you want me to go. Um, yes, you can go first. Stepped away or be on the phone. Um, I'll make mine fast. Uh, the first thing that we um, wrapped up this week that I'm really excited about is a needs assessment for the Indigent Defense Commission. Um, they are actually doing a presentation a little later this evening, so you'll get to hear about that, but um, it's really exciting. Um, th they also took some time, and for the grant administration side of it, um, I think both Leslie and Greg are also going to be a part of the presentation and are on the call, but they spent um, a lot of time meeting with me and answering a lot of my questions. So um, we did submit our needs assessment, which was the first step um, to be able to go forward with potential grant funding. Um, I'm just really excited about it. I think um, they have some exciting things and potential um, for projects we can look into. So I won't say too much about that because they will do a much better job sharing, but I just wanted to thank them as well as everybody that helped me with the needs assessment. Um, what I like to say is what we found from the needs assessment was a lot of need. So um, I, I'm excited to be able to do those a little, little more easily, I might say, in the future, because we will establish some better uh, systems. And I, I'm just excited about that. Um, I also want to give a shout out to Chief Mark, Marka, Mila, Bill Holse, uh, I know Ryan, and um, you've heard a little bit about their plans and their town hall meeting on February 9th. Um, and Mila's actually gonna cover another agenda item that was Mark Markham's update on that. Um, and one thing at some point this evening, or I can follow up in an email, um, but I'd love to get a sense of how many commissioners might want to participate in that town hall meeting so that uh, we know if we need to notice that as a special meeting. Um, the last thing is I, I did send a, a final request update for the CIB list that is due um, by March 1st, so it will be on our next agenda and it will be kind of tweaked to fit the format that they need of short-term projects, so the one-year projects um, that we are hoping to, to take on for 20 21 um, slash 2022 and then the longer term projects. So that should be coming soon. And I, I will try to get that out to everybody as soon as possible so that it is um, something you can all look closely at. That, that's all that I have. Thank you. Chris, are you available? Chris Baird? Okay, he must be busy. I know he's been extremely busy all day. So we are uh, to department reports. Economic development uh, report, department report, Elaine. Yes, good evening. Um, Mallory, I have to share my screen. Um, so if you can allow me to do that, that would be great. Okay. It It should be ready to go. Is it letting you do it? Yep. Can you see it? We can see it. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you, um, Madam Chair and Commissioners. I appreciate your time and I'll try to make this quick. I know you have a lot to go through on the agenda, but I wanted to give you a little bit of an overview. Some things basically last year and some things that um, we're doing at the very beginning of this year. So um, let me just 
Whoops. Okay. Um, we created for economic development last year, this ad, which I um, believe speaks to all of uh, the different things that you can do here in Moab. And we called it Think Moab. And we, we did have a video, which we're in the process of, of um, altering the very last part of it. It has to be changed to economic development. But I think what, what we were trying to do was to let businesses know that to think about our area and um, take a look at what their opportunities are. So I'm going to just show you this very quick video. So we wanted to let uh, people who may uh, think that they have uh, the opportunity to bring their business here, um, they can have it all. They can have outdoor recreation and they can work. So we're hoping that that will um, help us. We're going to update the very end to put our Recreate with Respect logo on there, and, um, and, but, but again, be posting that. Um, more from this office for economic development. We also try to help our businesses out, our local businesses out by supporting those that opted in for the shop in Utah. We really uh, worked with the businesses to gather their information, worked with the state because they made an all out effort to gather information from our community. So we have this, uh, this is actually on our uh, economic development page on the Grand County website. And then we went ahead, we did this last year, but we were a little more robust in our approach this year with all the businesses that are open in the winter. And we found that this has garnered a lot of um, uh, interest from people who are coming here. So we continue to update that business that businesses that are uh, were open, uh, if they've changed their hours or added a new service, we continue to, um, to put that on uh, and update that particular page. We also uh, created the new economic development quarterly newsletter, which is on the Grand County Economic Development uh, website on the grandcountyutah.net page. And we're really happy uh, the way it turned out. We think it has a lot of valuable information. And I would ask that uh, if you haven't taken a look that you um, take a minute to review this. Um, we're also providing a lot of updated information uh, content to the Grand County residents about uh, SBA loan information, uh, year-to-date occupancy, employment data, uh, sales tax rates. Uh, we just worked with Chris Baird on that and published that out to the county businesses and local community. Any grant opportunities, we're trying to keep on top of that. We've updated the Facebook page. Uh, we, we've got opportunity zone information on there as well as workforce services information. And we're hoping that this will help anyone that is interested in looking toward Grant County for uh, information, they'll be able to find it here. And if you're not aware, we started to tune into Grand County, Utah, that uh, is actually on the economic development page where people can, um, we're sending out a, an email blast. But if you go to the grandcountyutah.net economic development page, you're going to see uh, all of this information. And if you receive this tune in, uh, information, you're going to know that it is important that you need to look at it. And that's the reason um, we're sending it out. And as you can see on the right hand side, we've got quite a bit here. We actually have the BLM uh, information going on this week that we put out there to to the community talked about the enterprise zone, the pay, pay, paycheck protection program and a ho whole host of other things. So we're really trying to make sure that we keep the community well informed of all the opportunities that are um, happening here in the county. And let me see if I can get this to work. Oops. 
Uh, so looking ahead to economic development, I, I believe we've got a tremendous opportunity, especially with the creation of the Economic Diversification Advisory Council. Um, and that will be to assist the Grand County Commission in reviewing ordinances to identify barriers to economic diversification and to recommend policy and law that enhance opportunities for economic diversification in Grand County. I think this is so important because we really need to find our way and set things in motion for the future. We need to help uh, create businesses with business growth in our community and business expansion and retention. We need to re recruit skilled workers and provide workforce training. Uh, and partnering with the Southeast Utah Association of Local Governments, the SBDC, the Governor's Office of Economic Development, uh, the Economic Development Corporation of Utah and USDA. And I've been working diligently to build and strengthen our relationships with all of these organizations for the benefit of Grant County. And also we need to talk about economic gardening, which is a term that was actually coined out of Colorado, that we need to look inside of our community to determine what business sectors may leave and how we can help to retain uh, jobs in our community and keep people employed. So uh, it's exciting, I think, to be uh, here in economic development at this time in Grand County um, as we you know, look toward the future. Uh, also, we, we need to talk about brown, brown fields and do we have areas within Grand County that can be remediated and repurposed? And I'm looking into uh, funding that may help us to be able to do that. Uh, revolving loan funds, uh, public improvement districts, community development block grants, tax increment financing, public improvement districts, and all of these um, available opportunities that we have to research and, and determine if they're right for, for Grant County to move forward on. We definitely need to look at fiber uh, and how we can gain high-speed internet for entire the entire Grant County area so that everyone, um, everyone has the availability of it here especially people that, uh, businesses that may wanna come here uh, and have their employees work from here. So we need to build a community that attracts, supports and grows businesses. We need to desperately prevent exporting our children out of Grant County. We need to find jobs that will keep them here. Uh, we need to make sure that we can work on that so that um, the future of our community is that children can live near their parents and, and the grandparents can see the grandchildren. And we need to establish what is our vision for Grand County. So it's exciting. Um, let me go back here. So we took, um, that's a fast recap on economic development, but we also did a complete overhaul on the Moab Area Travel Council. And I would ask that um, you take a minute and go through the, uh, the page on Grand County, Utah, Dot net to the Travel Council. And what we have here, we talk about the Travel Council, but more importantly, um, and we also talk about being members of the Global Sustainable Tourism Council, which actually the uh, Utah Office of Tourism just joined and leave no trace. And we also list all of the functions that um, the Travel Council does and it includes, but are not limited to, and you can see there's an enormous amount of um, things that we work on here. And I think when the local community doesn't really understand what the Travel Council does, I would actually point them to go to this page and see the fact that we answer all the visitor calls come in here. They don't go to the Moab Information Center. They come in here about 12,000 calls annually. We have an in-house graphic design uh, team that work on creating all the collateral and the advertising and eliminating the expense of outside design. Uh, we, we make sure that we're working with all the public land agencies, the BLM National Park Service, uh, everyone, uh, the Forest Service to make sure that we develop accurate and consistent uh, information and messaging that we can put out there. So we, we do quite a bit here. We monitor all of the overnight rentals. We monitor who's paying, who's not paying and work with the tax commission. We're working now uh, to validate uh, TRCC and, and take a good hard look into that with uh, the taxes um, being paid there. We obviously handle uh, the Grand County special events uh, that are occurring in the county. 
uh, with the exception of OSTA, that'll be handled by Angela, um, Angela Book out at OSTA. And we promote sustainability. So there's a whole entire list of all of the things that, that we do here at the Travel Council. And I would recommend that um, we you know, direct your constituents to go to these pages. Uh, we also have 3 million visitors that go to the website, 73 mil million Facebook followers. Uh, and we put some of the new advertising up there so that they'll have an idea of uh, how we're moving in order to uh, have follow the, the resolution and make sure that our advertising all points to, um, uh, you know, recreate, recreating with respect. And then we have marketing opportunities available for the local business community. We wish that more businesses would participate. Uh, we, you know, we send hundreds of thousands of links to local businesses from our website. It's free advertising. We would encourage every business to fill out the information and send it off to the Travel Council. And if you would like, we found it that if we can provide a pixel that you uh, businesses can place on their website, we do have a number of businesses that do that. We're able to see the efficacy of our marketing and advertising. And then of course, um, the Do It Like a Moab Local, we've uh, really transitioned that into a sustainable tourism uh, website, which is amazing. That uh, website is completely turned over where it does take into uh, consideration all of the leave no trace and, and so much more. And then we've got outgoing statistics uh, that will, you know, some of the businesses may find uh, beneficial. So that uh, is the website um, page. We also uh, provide some financial support to the Film Commission, the Moab Information Center towards staff, and we also uh, support the, the MIC with finances to keep the only restroom, public restrooms we have in town, downtown open for visitors. We, um, the budget also contributes to art trails. We have grant funding for shoulder season events. Uh, the, and again, the Travel Council answers all of the funds from visitors. Uh, we support the county and the Southeast Utah Health Department in providing, you know, updated information relative to COVID-19. We secured about 150,000 masks that we still have some masks in the back if businesses need them. We've been taking them down to the, um, uh, the uh, Canyon Lanes Copy Center for them to distribute. And then all of our current uh, marketing materials are reflecting the recreate with respect. Uh, this is just an example of this uh, logo that was created here for the Do It Like a Moab local to preserve and protect. But you will see this on all of our upcoming um, marketing uh, ads that we, we will be doing in the future. And then each category has a lot of sustainable information and I would ask that you take a look at it to see We've had a lot of great compliments with all the information here that's available. Uh, we also monitor the TRT collections, business licenses for overnight rentals. Uh, we provide locals and visitor occupancy reports, park visitation. We update all the information again from the BLM, the Forest Service, everyone. We also track visa view spending here. And as you'll note, the domestic visitor and lodging spends 240 um, dollars per night and 15 cents per night, while the international visitor, when they were here, spent $278.08 per night. And then the domestic visitor in restaurants spends about $39.57 average per visitor, while the international visitor, when they're here, spends $54.83 per visitor. And we're going to be able to get uh, more granular on the way we're looking at all of our information. And this is just one example. We've created a, um, a dashboard that will provide uh, myself and um, uh, others with information. For instance, on this particular map, we can see the percentages of where our visitation comes from. So you can see that Texas is 7.32% of our visitation. Uh, California is 8.69%. And then um, Colorado is 14.1%. And we can definitely drill down into these areas. And you can see up in the Pacific Northwest where we had advertised for several years that we still have 
uh, quite a bit of uh, visitation that comes out of uh, Washington State. And then, of course, we moved down into, um, into California and um, we're making, you know, we had made a lot of progress in that, that market. So then if you look at more information about the dashboard, this will tell you where uh, you can see where people are coming from. You can even see points of interest. We can get down to see who rents UTVs, how many people, who goes to Dead Horse Point, um, how many people are going to, to commercial campsites. So uh, I feel that this is really going to help us in making better decisions uh, for the, the, the county and also be able to make sure that we're investing any marketing spend uh, that we would have in the future, uh, making the right decisions or focusing on areas where you've got uh, higher demographic income in hoping that they'll uh, consider coming here to open their business. Uh, we've also got visitor profile that tells us how many people came from different parts of the United States, what city they came from, and all of the um, particular information for that area. We also know that we can drill down into a city and a zip code level for information that um, is, is put into all of this uh, mapping that we're, that we're able to, um, to download. And then again, uh, we, we look at spending patterns uh, by state. So the dashboard that, we're, that I've been working on over the last five, six months uh, with Love Communications is really going to enable us to know more about who's coming to Moab, when they're coming to Moab, what they're doing in Moab, what are they spending, or I should say Grand County, in Grand County, and be able to provide us with a lot of that, um, a lot of that insight. And then spending patterns, again, for Visa View, you can see Utah is obviously the biggest for lodging, the biggest spending, and then you go to California, Washington. So all of this is really gonna, gonna help us as we go forward and, um, and provide and hopefully help our businesses because I believe that all of the information we're capturing uh, and once we start working with um, on the economic development side in this office with sitting down with our businesses and tell and asking them how they're managing uh, you know their their employees what where we see people coming from what are they doing with social media all of this information we're gathering is going to be a huge huge help to um, to our local businesses so um, I thank you with your time for your time and thank you for letting me present I really appreciate it um, this is just a little bit of what we did there's a whole lot more. But, um, and if you would like to come over to the uh, Travel Council, or if you'd like to do a Zoom meeting, I can certainly help walk you through um, anything you'd like to see, or if you have any questions, uh, let me know and we'll schedule a meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine, very, uh, very well done. Uh, do we have any questions? Do any of the commissioners have any questions they'd like to ask Elaine at this time? Or she surely covered a lot. <laughs> Thank you, Elaine. Thank yeah, maybe, you. Maybe it's a comment. I just want to say, yeah, that's a impressive list of activities and a lot of really interesting data. And I hope we see more of it in the future. So thank you. Thank you. I, I have one quick question. Yes, certainly. Um, I really like the pivot to, to um, advocate for responsible recreation and like sustainable recreation. And I'm just wondering if any funds are going into specific programs or projects in Moab that enhance the sustainability of recreation or whether it's all just going towards like advertisement, promoting we have, that. Idea. We have actually, we have no advertising right now going on. We have nothing, we have no advertising at all planned yet at all for the rest of the year right now. Um, but any, uh, we have a couple of uh, any social media that we're doing out of this office is always going to have the recreate with respect or some type of sustainability message. Anything that comes out of this office, no matter what it is, whether it's social media, whether it will be, um, you know, uh, eventually print advertising. We have a couple of small pieces that we did in um, 
and actually the Jeep Safari magazine that talk about staying on the trail, recreate with respect. Uh, we did one in the Grand Circle magazine because we had negotiated, you have to negotiate your market, your advertising pieces out. And we did that last fall, but right now we have nothing else coming out. So we're actually working on uh, updating all of our graphics and we're working with our um, videographer who did all of our original videos because now we have to switch over all of our current videos to meet uh, the resolution and put the right um, messaging along with that recreate with respect. So everything you see uh, will have that messaging on it. And I might add that the travel council uh, two years ago, we joined the, the um, global sustainable tourism council. We had, I had joined that. I took a class uh, with them and got my certificate. But we had started working with um, Rosemary Russo when she was at the city and we're really ramping up where we were going with sustainability. And we have an amazing sustainability video that I had done here um, a year and two years ago. And I think you all should watch it if you're concerned about sustainability that talks about everything that this little community does. It's about I think eight or nine minutes, but it's an amazing video that even though we're a small community, it shows you how amazing and powerful we really are. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, compliments from people uh, from different parts of the country, from the Global Sustainable Tourism Council uh, about how wonderful that and amazing that video was. And that we are, the, the Travel Council was far ahead of the state of Utah tourism and our counterparts in the, in the uh, state by moving forward with supporting um, sustainability and supporting Leave No Trace. Uh, and I think we stuck our necks out there. We got out there. We said this is important to us. And now other counties are jumping on board, as is the uh, Utah Office of Tourism. I want to weigh in too quickly, Sarah, and you will hear a lot more about transient room tax as we, especially in this general session, are working on that bill. But the statute um, does heavily regulate how we can use those funds. So what it says is establish and promote. And then in another place, it says an establishment can't mean any of these other things, which includes really everything I think most people think as establishing tourism. So we clearly can't use it for asset building, construction, maintenance, any of that stuff. But your word, the programming is exactly where we're starting to look into what kind of flexibility we can have. And so it is something that we are starting to work on. Thank you. Yeah, I know you all have put a lot of work into it. I'm just trying to get caught up to where we are now. So thank you. Well, and Sarah, if you would like to see anything at all, um, we could schedule a quick meeting and I can walk you through everything that we're doing. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, Thank you. I, okay, sorry, go, ahead, go ahead, Evan. It takes me a minute to unmute. Uh, <laughs> Elaine, that, that video, um, back to the economic development and business recruitment, I'm just curious of uh, where that would get shown or, or how potential businesses looking to relocate would uh, would see something like that and kind of what platforms are being used for the video and other outreach efforts? Um, actually, we since we have no budget for anything, we're actually just posting it on our uh, economic development page and on um, any Facebook page that we have. So we haven't put that video out there and we don't want to put it out there until we have the logo uh, at the very end changed and we add the recreate with respect because we did that before the resolution. So, but I just wanted to give you an idea. I did run the ad last year in the business magazine in that um, Utah's business magazine. Um, I think it was September. We ran it just, just to kind of get our toe in the water and I've talked to, I sent the video back then and the ad back then to the um, uh, economic development, uh, Ut the Utah and GoEd, so they could see what we were doing just because we had never, Grand County had never done anything like that before for 
economic development. And I wanted to show that you could come here, work here and you know, do business here and then go out and recreate. So they were really pleased to see uh, the video, but we, we have not put you know, any funding behind it at all this, we, this year because we were waiting to get our budget approved. Yeah, and uh, I think that's all great and all makes sense. Um, I definitely appreciate like that that angle on it with the videos and and you know some low cost kind of things that that uh, could gain some traction and, and not necessarily today, but in the future future reports, I would be interested in if uh, in hearing what kind of uh, businesses might be kicking the tires from these kind of efforts. You know, uh, if there was uh, you know, outdoor gear manufacturers or, um, you know, the, some of the solar panel kind of, you know, alternative energy sort of things. Mm -hmm. Um, I would just be curious of, of who's noticing us. And, you know, as you kind of have conversations with specific folks that are curious about Moab, um, when we get to that point, I would just mm -hmm. like to hear about it. Well, I think one of the more important things, and I, I had talked to Curtis Wells about this last fall when he was on the commission, that uh, the com you know we, we need to really identify what businesses we'd like to have in Grand County and what we would like to bring to Grand County, uh, which would then allow me, based on our planning and zoning and water and everything else. So what businesses do we identify that we would like to see here? Uh, and then that would allow me to really go out and court these companies from all over the world, wherever they are, uh, and say, hey, you know, a clothing manufacturer. We, we have had some interest from a couple of small uh, companies that we're looking here, but I think more importantly, we, we as a, or you all as a commission need to, we need to meet and, and determine what is our way forward? What are we looking to be and what are we looking to bring in here to help our community with better jobs? You know, how do we move forward so people can afford to live and work here? And I think if we can establish those, those ground rules, that foundation, then that will allow me to, uh, and I believe me, I've got the support of GoEd, the support of EDC Utah. They all want to work with me. We just need to say, okay, this is what we're looking for, and this is what we want to target. And then these are, you know, do we have, uh, what do we have to offer as far as um, community reinvestment areas or tax increment financing? What are all of the financial opportunities? What, what can we talk about that we may have to offer to companies? So I think we, we have a lot to do to build that, that sort of foundation we need for us to be able to then uh, securely go out and say, okay, X business, we want to sit down and talk to you. We think you'd be a great fit for, for Grand County. Great. No, I, I think that that, you know, with the new uh, board or whatever we're titling it, I think yeah. that that'd be one of yeah. the first for sure. That, that's going to really help. That's going to make a, a big difference. I think once we get the committee going and they've gotten their feet on the ground, it would be good to do a retreat with the committee and with the commission and really start to look at a vision. Yes. I and, and, be and I also have um, a couple of um, individuals that uh, would be willing to come down and meet with us to sort of give us the inside track on uh, all of these uh, sort of opportunities for, uh, because they're working with other areas within the state and they work with GOED and they work with the um, Southeast Utah Association of Local Governments. And I know they're working in you know, Carbon and Emory and San Juan, but we can set up a session where they can, you know, come in and meet with us, present to us, tell us what they feel works, what doesn't work and how we can, you know, work with our local, whether it's a school district or whatever, you know, entity it is to help them understand why we need to move, how beneficial it will be to move 
in this direction. So uh, it really is an exciting time for, uh, for myself, uh, for economic development. And I think for all of the county commissioners to, to really be able to put a stake in the ground and say, we are now gonna move our, our community forward in this way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very thank, much. Thank you very much. Anybody else ready to move on? Okay, thank you. That was a good presentation. Uh, we are now to the Ute presentation on Utah Indigenous Defense a Grants. Mary, did uh, you want to insert Chris Bear's report at some point since he wasn't available? I, I text him and uh, he hasn't texted me back as to when he wants to uh, report. Okay. Oh, no, he just did. He just did, yes. He said yeah, yes. I, I do. Um, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I'm uh, multitasking big time right now. I was on the phone doing some uh, legislative issues. Um, but along those lines, I've been spending a lot of time um, working on the county's um, legislative priorities, which we'll go over uh, later on the agenda. I also went out to a uh, pre-construction uh, meeting for Dalton Wells. So the contractor came out along with the um, the state's construction manager, and we had Andrea uh, Brand from Samplatz out there, and so um, kind of uh, haggled a little bit with the arrangements. And I think we're gonna, you know, change things around a little bit, but that project's good to go, and so we're just working on a proposed agreement. Uh, for management, and uh, I'll bring that to the commission when we get it prepared. So <clears throat> that's all moving along. Um, you know, of course, uh, it's really a fallback. Our, our priority is to get the state park approved. Um, but if that doesn't go through, then uh, we can probably work something out to manage that new campground. Um, and so be bringing that forward pretty soon. I don't know if anybody has brought it up yet. Um, but there's a lot of, uh, we've been receiving a lot of phone calls and emails that Grand County canceled or denied um, Jeep Safari, which is not true. So we'll be having a meeting with the event sponsors tomorrow morning to get a better idea of what's going on. But just to be clear, Grand County, neither Grand County nor the city of Moab has denied or canceled the Jeep Safari. So I just want to make that clear. And, um, other than that, most of the things I've been working on are, are uh, on the agenda, so we'll discuss them when we get to them. And I assume uh, Mallory probably did her report? Yes. And okay. Chris, thank you so much for being on top of this uh, TRT bill. It will make right. a huge difference in our county if it passes. Thank you. Okay, now we're to the uh, presentation of the Utah Indigenous Defense Grants. Joanne. Landau, I'm not sure if I pronounced that, uh, Director uh, Adam Troop, uh, Utah Indigenous Defense Commission's Assistant Director. Thank you. Hi, I am Joanna Landau, the Director of the Utah Indigent Defense Commission, um, and Adam Troop, who you probably may know, some of you may recognize from UAC, is our Assistant Director now. We recruited him to the good side. Um, to help us out with this. So indigent defense is not necessarily familiar to all county commissions and commissioners, yet you are charged with administering it. So I thought I would start with a really quick background, just about 225 years of history in one or two slides, and to catch you up on maybe what you might not fully understand about indigent defense and the way it works in Utah, if that's all right. And I think I can share my screen. Mine is not nearly as fancy as the last presentation. And I am, I did just give it to EOCJ in the legislature. So forgive me that I haven't changed the title. So we, the Indigent Defense Commission was actually created in 2016 and the Office of Indigent Defense Services last year. The office is really the day-to-day -day entity that does all the work I'm about to tell you about. And the commission is the policy body. So all the work we do derives from the Sixth Amendment to the Bill of Rights. And that Sixth Amendment gives you the right to counsel if you are hailed into court and charged with a criminal offense. Or in Utah, if you are charged with the 
uh, if you are facing the termination of your parental rights. So that amendment back in 1791 forms the basis for everything we do for Utah. It was really important to the to the founders, right? Give me tyranny or give me liberty or give me death, prevent the tyranny of big government. And Utah valued that enormously too. And we have actually had the right to counsel back since 1888, even though we haven't known exactly how to provide for it, we had it as the first state or territory in our laws. I didn't actually know that until a couple of years ago. And I think that's really interesting to think about. It's also carried through into our constitution and our code. So the catch with Utah is that even though we have long had these rights, we have delegated them to you all, to counties and to cities. So 29 counties and at any given time, 247, 246 cities are charged with providing these responsibilities. Even though in 1963, the United States Supreme Court told the country that it was actually the state's responsibility to ensure that indigent defense services, these attorneys who are appointed to represent people, it is the state's responsibility to ensure that's constitutional. I suspect you have lots of questions about why that's delegated to you. Feel free to interrupt me at any time. This is the 225 years of history on one slide. So it packs it a lot. And it's really just meant to skim an overview of why we were created. We were created in 2016 because there were concerns about the disparities about how different counties were providing public defense. So you can imagine Salt Lake County with a budget of 21 approximately million dollars is providing indigent defense very differently to say Grand County with a budget for indigent defense of about $260,000. The problem with Utah is we didn't know how everyone was providing that and how what your $260,000 were doing and necessarily what Salt Lake counties were, let alone Paiute, Daggett, Box Elder, all 29 counties and the cities. So we were created to help try and understand how Utah localities are providing indigent defense services to look, collect data, to provide guidance on how to make sure those, those public defenders are doing constitutional work, and then to provide funding to help you do both. That's a lot. I'm gonna switch to now your uh, three years of law school in one slide. So indigence is defined in code. So anyone who is at 150% of the federal poverty level or below is entitled to a public defender. That being said, the code also allows judges who do the appointing to make some exceptions. They have discretion. So if you're slightly wealthier than, earn, if you're earning say twenty twenty five thousand dollars a year, you may still qualify for a public defender because you have a number of dependents, or you can't, you don't have access to liquid cash. There are various circumstances that judges can look to to make sure that people get appointed counsel. And again, it's that that Sixth Amendment right to counsel because you want to make sure everyone gets a fair trial. So if I can afford to hire an attorney, I get a fair trial with that attorney, just like someone who can't afford an attorney gets a fair trial. That's the importance of public defenders. Public defenders get appointed to, for all, as I said, all adults facing all criminal offenses. So that's a misdemeanor C, uh, driving on a suspended license all the way to aggravated murder. All kids facing juvenile court proceedings those are the more serious proceedings that come into juvenile courts. The legislature requires that public defenders be appointed immediately for children because we don't want minors in court alone. And then parents, as I said, facing termination of parental rights. So the interesting thing about this for county commissions is that if DCFS or a private party is trying to terminate parental rights, the entire process is funded by the state the guardian ad litems, the prosecutors, the AGs, DCFS, and the courts, except for defenders. So your county attorney, Christina Sloan, does not defend these cases or does not prosecute these cases, but you are responsible for defending, paying for the defense of them. So this is an interesting area that I think counties maybe haven't totally recognized in which we'd love to help counties think about the future of. Then again, anyone appealing to our Utah Court of Appeals or Utah Supreme Court from these proceedings. Okay, everyone should be asleep by now. That's 225 years of history and, and three years of law school that none of you all asked for. Um, but I will keep going unless I can't see everyone. So you'll just have to interrupt me and I'll be done in just another slide. 
So this is more relevant maybe to the legislature than to a small county, but I think it is interesting. Many states provide public defense systems. They take this on entirely. Our neighbor, Colorado, entirely runs public defense services. So they do not delegate it to counties or cities. The state takes responsibility for that. The same with some of our other neighbors. And they, you can see that they adopted it right shortly after that Supreme Court ruling. Other states have taken on public defender services after litigation. And then many states also do what Utah does, which is to share it with their local governments. There has been litigation around public defense services in states, and they have focused on these states that do share it with local counties because the state has less direct control of how these services are provided. So we're doing our best to try and help the state and counties ensure that everyone is getting that constitutional right to an effective defender. Effective defense is one of those things that affects everyone in the courtroom and county budgets. It helps you save jail bed days. It helps your prosecutor do a better, do the job that she needs to do and to stay in her role. It helps your judges stay in their roles. It ensures a more efficient use of court time. And again, it helps protect people hailed into court facing, facing the scariest days of their lives, right? Being faced with a criminal offense or the loss of their children. So our commission has 15 members. It is one of the few commissions to have local government representation. We have two county commissioners. Um, right now it is Sean Milne and Lorraine Kamalu. So we have a county commissioner from a county of the third through sixth class and one from a first or second, second class. And I believe they are involved in USAC, which I think um, Commissioner Wojtek, you mentioned being a part of, um, at least Commissioner Kamalu is. So she's someone to reach out to about more information on this. This is our office. We are the ones who do the help with counties. We help, um, Mallory gave us a really great introduction. She talked about filling out a needs assessment. That is our new entry to our grant program. We've, we've evolved our grant program over the years and we've realized we really, really need to hear from you all to be able to figure out our grants and how to fund them. And now my dog decided to start barking. So that's wonderful. I'll just stop here. This is the range of things we work on for the state. Um, last year, you may or may not know that the state actually did take over all appellate representation for counties of the third through sixth class. So I mentioned that you have the right to counsel if you're appealing a criminal conviction. That goes up to the Court of Appeals or the Utah Supreme Court. And we now pay for the defense of those cases because counties, it was a resource that really needed to be improved from the state level. So I have get thrown a bunch of things at you. I'd just like to pivot to now looking at Grand County. We haven't worked with Grand County yet. We work with about 60% of counties at this point. We have been making our way through the state, trying to help counties and get involved. And Mallory has been great in working with my staff and trying to fill out this needs assessment. One thing we realized is that there's a gap in what everybody knows about how Grand County provides indigent defense. So I've talked to your public defender, um, Mallory has talked to you all, but what we really want to engage with you all about is how we can best help the county improve public defense services. I'm going to give it to Adam to talk a little bit about some of the numbers that we know about Grand County, and then we will move to any questions unless you have any now. I don't see anyone unmuting, so I will share one more screen and let Adam talk. In the meantime, Adam, maybe you can introduce yourself and tell them. Okay. Uh, I'm Adam Troop. I started with the Indigent Defense Commission at the very beginning of last year, came in just as we we're getting ready for the legislative session. Um, and I have worked with Joanna, who didn't mention that she's been building this office from nothing, from the ground up for the last five years. And we're in our fifth year. We are working with um, a large number of counties in the state. And I think we're making a lot of progress in helping county governments understand what we can provide and how we can support the, the work that you have to do, as Joanna just said, and which I think a lot of counties don't understand that well. It's not something that is in the middle of uh, anybody's portfolio or at the top of anybody's portfolio. So we're really here to try to bring that uh, forward, to elevate that, uh, the attention to that. And, uh, some of the ways we do that are to help point out where some of the challenges are 
with data collection, with knowing what's going on in your system and evaluating how your uh, contract attorneys are doing. So that is what we're starting with on this uh, document that Joanna is gonna show. So um, I'm not sure whether, can you enlarge that a little bit so I can read it without large glasses? That's great, I think. It is, it is still hard to read, it is packed with data. <laughs> It is packed with data and we recognize that, but one of the reasons we wanted to do it was to put in front of you this kind of information and hope that you'll take it and look at it later. Or if you don't want to do that, call us and have us explain it in more detail because it is, there are a couple of things that are relevant about it. What we're looking at in this document, obviously, is your contract attorneys who are on the left side. Those are the defense attorneys who cover the different court levels from justice court through, uh, through adult criminal court, juvenile court on both the delinquency side and the child welfare side. What we have in terms of numbers of cases is what we've taken as a snapshot. But to be quite honest, we're not sure how accurate that is. Um, and yet I think it's probably more accurate than most counties have available to them through their own system because it is not as though this has been accurately correct, collected for a long time. What we are trying to do as we go through this for counties we're working uh, with or potentially working with is to show this is what it looks like to us. How do we get better information or how do we make sure it's completely accurate? And what are the tools we have? Um, we do have benefit of a data system that we've um, taken on and that a lot of counties are using, which gets us to more um, accurate information, which gets us to more definite numbers uh, when those counties and the attorneys who are on contract are working with. But as we look at these numbers, if we take them as being the best we have right now, what we have in the next column about current full-time attorneys is if we're looking at an attorney taking on just adult criminal cases, just for those cases in Grand County, and we um, we identify what a reasonable caseload would be, meaning what is that caseload you need to be able to do the full, uh, the full set of responsibilities you should be able to do, including having time to talk to your client, making sure you show up and are available for all hearings, preparation for hearings, all of those things that go into making someone um, a, a strong defender and able to represent their client zealously. We take those numbers of uh, cases that we identify within Grand County. We apply a caseload standard number, which is at the bottom of the document there. We come up with a number that shows how many attorneys full-time would, would Grand County need to cover all of those uh, caseloads, to cover all those cases. Again, all of these are estimates. We're talking about a range of attorneys. As you can see at the bottom, we say 1973, there was a an ABA study that was done, which came back and said, in 1973, here's how many cases uh, an attorney working full-time should be able to cover, cover effectively. We did a, another study recently through the IDC and did a more um, focused study on what it looks like in 2019 and what practitioners in the field believe they need to um, the caseloads they could handle effectively. And we came up with much different numbers. Uh, much lower caseloads are recommended by the Delphi panel than by the 1973 standards. And so really our sense is the requirement is somewhere in the middle. We shoot for at least the 1973 standards with those counties we're working with, uh, but we hope to have uh, lower caseloads and more approaching the Delphi panel when, when possible. So that background being, um, being explained, I hope well enough with all the detail there, we come up with a number that obviously says, here's what you think we could, we, uh, what we think would be best caseload and the best option for the county. Something that really is crucial to mention is the case and the caseload type that people are carrying is really the best proxy we have for evaluating performance right now. What we're really looking at is capacity and the concept that if you have too high of a caseload, it's gonna be hard to provide really quality representation. So as we look at this, the question is what is the capacity that's available within 
Grand County for the attorneys working these cases. Um, we hope in future to go beyond caseload of numbers, but before, but to, to get to real evaluation of performance and what attorneys are doing in their practice. But before that, we just need to know what the environment looks like. We need to know case numbers to show how high a burden people are facing and, uh, and work forward from there to build processes that help evaluate performance. So that is my summary of the data in the form. Joanna, you probably have something to add, but I'll leave it there. And uh, actually we we'll welcome questions on that document uh, now or in future. Yeah, and we'll definitely share them with you all. I would just say one last thing. We don't expect you county commissioners who aren't attorneys to know all this and to understand it and to memorize it all. One of the things that we help county counties do is get organ more organized public defense with a public a managing public defender who can communicate these things to you, right? They can do the oversight. They can be the, understand the caseloads. They can do the monitoring and the data reporting, which helps you know what you're paying for in public defense and then keeps you able to do all of the other things that you do as county commissioners. <clears throat> so we would really like to work with Grand County is the last thing I will say. <laughs> Are there, did we terrify you all? It's late, late and we just gave you so much information. So, oh. Go ahead, Gabriel. So the conclusion, um, especially based on that last document is that we're 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 kind of uh, maybe not to a total lost cause, but we got some work to do. <laughs> you are not a lost cause. You're, You're not, not a great a public cause. defender. And uh, you know, what we found is that all counties have a little work to do. Even Salt Lake County, mm -hmm. right? With that huge budget, there are aspects of Salt Lake County that needed improvement as well. And it's just because no one has ever really set these guidelines out um, for public defense. So. We are not here to indict, we are here to help, right? To say, these are some areas that we might be able to enhance your public defense services to make sure you don't have any exposure and are providing them adequately. I add that we, I mean, Joanne is more so than I am, but we're familiar with the attorneys you have on contract. And so Gabriel, I would say you're certainly not a lost cause for that reason too. Um, there are challenges in other parts of the state but the reality is you've got reasonable caseloads. We can work with it. Um, obviously, that's the case. But the other, the other piece is how do we move forward from here? How do we help you? Um, and I think that's what we're doing with a number of counties, including we've helped people regionalize the work they're doing, right? So a um, few counties working together out in the Uinta Basin helps to spread their resources out across low population areas. And, low lawyer population areas. So we are developing options for them to help pull those folks together. I just would like to weigh in and thank you for this presentation. I learned some stuff as well. And I think there is often a, a very big disconnect with your commissioners and commission offices. And that's not um, to say anything badly about any of our folks, but it is a, you know, an area of the world that most folks have not ever been in a criminal proceeding. Um, the concept of effective defense is um, hard to grasp. And especially with a commission who is very concerned with budgets and the bottom line, um, you know, trying to, to both stay in my role as a prosecutor, but also support my commission, understanding how important that effective defense is and how fundamental the constitutional right to effective defense is and that um, performance is a very important metric for making the system work um, is really important and I am so excited that IDC has been quite aggressive with us and I appreciate it and I know we can be slow to respond as hard as I know Mallory and Chris are working on it. Um, yes, we are very happy to have you. Thank you, Christina. Anyone else? Um, yeah. Uh, early in the presentation, Joanna mentioned grants and it wasn't clear to me, are these like cost sharing grants or grants to do studies that we wouldn't otherwise fund or what, what's the nature of these grants? That's a great question if I can answer it. Um, the nature of these grants are that we, the state has not yet decided to take over public defense. So 
the one condition of our grant is that you not cut your spending. So that two hundred and sixty thousand dollars that you spend would be the requirement to stay that to maintain. On top of that, our grants can supplement, can provide additional attorneys, can provide that managing defender, can provide case management system so that those defenders can report to you, can provide ad administrative assistance that help the attorneys do their job. We also in some counties have social workers working with um, parental defenders to really help parents and families stay together so that we keep kids out of the whole system if we keep families together. So there's not a one size fits all model for our grants. The only precondition is that you, well, there's two conditions. There's always conditions with grants, but you keep maintain your funding and it is a reimbursement grant. So it has the effect sometimes of looking like you're ballooning your budget because we're adding on a hundred or $200,000 grant, whatever the case may be, we have grants all over the map, but we do reimburse those grants on a quarterly basis. Um, so we're, we're very quick at getting that back into your budget, even though we do require the submission of the expenses up front. Does that answer your question? So I just have a clarifying question, Joanne. Um, is it correct that the um, maintain that maintaining our current level of funding is based on the prior three year amounts or average or something like that? Yeah, there's a statutory requirement, Chris, and I think that's almost exactly what it says. I don't have it right in front of me, but yeah, um, if your spending fluctuated and in COVID. We all know there will be variations and varieties. Um, it is not the, and also we know that counties budget and don't always spend what they budget, right? So they're, we're willing to work with you about that baseline amount. We just, to be able to keep arguing for funding from the legislature to supplement this, we can't at this point say counties are cutting their budgets to get our money. Okay. So yeah, I guess the, the concern potentially that we have is we're in the process right now of renegotiating our contract with our public defender. And we would like to um, make that a managing public defender contract. Um, but our, our contract with uh, our public defender expired at the end of last year. And so on the agenda tonight is um, a contract that does increase his compensation. And I just wanted to make sure that, but it's just month to month at this point until we get our final um, agreement in place for a public defender system. I just wanted to make sure that that increase in compensation is not going to, um, you know, affect our ability to, to receive compensation for developing a managing public defender agreement and system. The things that go into the managing public defender are really, can we get someone who can help oversee uh, the system and ideally oversee multiple systems. So um, uh, Adam mentioned the 8th district that you went to Basin. Um, in that case, you have counties working together, but you also have counties working with cities. So you have Moab City Justice Court, which Aaron also does. And perhaps we could build a regional system that way in addition to the defenders working around this area. So I would say we look at more holistically at the big picture and we just ask you to submit all of your financials so we know exactly what we're dealing with. And then, you know, we we try and maintain consistent approaches to all counties so that no one feels like we're making any special agreements for any other county, but we are able to work with counties and meet them where they are. So let's keep having that conversation, Chris. Okay. And Chris and everybody else, if I'm correct, um, I know Greg, reference the statute, um, but it is the three prior years. So if we go into an increased month to month uh, contract with our public defender, primary public defender, um, that, that could have effect long term. Right now it is our calendar, our three calendar years prior. So getting getting through not having a contract right now won't play into that, for lack of a better words. Not having a public defender would be a much bigger problem for you than this potential raise, which we can definitely work with. So let me just say it that way. 
Thank you. Um, and on my end, I hadn't even thought about the Moab City Justice Court. So um, I, I think that that's, that's a huge piece that never crossed my mind. And I know personally, I'm really, really excited for, for the next steps. And I don't know time-wise or um, on your all end of it, um, if we could talk to what the next steps would be, I, I know you've kind of changed the process this year to make it more of a collaborative process, which I love. Um, then it's not just one person writing the grant, but it's bringing everyone together and establishing those goals. Where is there the need? Um, it, it just seems like a great, great process. Um, and I, I think the next steps are those meetings. So I'm wondering what that would entail and who would be involved in that. So um, I think Leslie is still on here. She is my data and research person. And I think you've spoken with her and Greg Mallory. Um, and we've, in this new grant process, we really do want to have that collaborative meeting. So I would say the next step would be to establish that who would like to come to that meeting. So I would definitely bring your public defender, Mallory, at a, one of you who, do any of the county commissioners in Grand have indigent defense in their portfolio? Is that, is there no one who, is there someone charged with the court or with any aspect of this? Because it would be, if someone, if a county commissioner were there, I think that would be ideal too, just because you are the signer on the dotted line or <laughs> signer of the dotted line. You're saying that it would be good for have a county commissioners are rotating or, or have us attend the court hearings? Is that what you're saying? No, have, attend our grant meeting to figure out um, how best to make our grant operate to help Grand County. Okay, I got confused there, obviously. So if it's and not in the county, oh, sorry. And how often do uh, those meetings happen? Um, our grants are on a year-to-year -year basis, and so to get the grant going, it would be once a year, um, and then we would want to touch base again to make sure our grants are operating the way you want them to be, um, but really just one meeting to figure out exactly how that grant could best operate. Okay, thank you. May I ask, a, can I ask another question? Um, yes. So if it if public defense, which you are charged with and which you have a budget line item for, is not in a county commissioner portfolio, Christina, is it under your office or where is where is the budget or is it under the county administration? Can you explain that to me where it's? It's under the county administrator's office. Okay. That's not unusual. We, we have a, an entire fund that's for um, public defense. So, and that's managed by uh, myself under the commission office and so that's where we have our uh, budget for uh, our public defender at this point in time we also have a separate contract for parental defender and it's also where we have all of our uh, conflict attorney budgets so it's an entire fund specific to public uh, indigent defense got it that's very helpful um can I ask one more question Chris <laughs> yeah is there an, a line item in there for any defense resources? So outside of their contracts, if a defender needs to investigate a case or hire an expert witness, do you have a budget line item for that? Uh, we can talk more offline as well. Um, These are the kind, kind of things we can help with for sure. My recollection is our conflict budget is just large and vague. This is our budget right here up on the screen. So we've got, we do have, um, the main public defender contract, which is with Aaron Wise. We do have special legal services, which would be where we would um, oftentimes pull, you know, those kinds of uh, expenses that are may or may not occur. And then we have a budget for conflict attorney, parental defender, um, and then, uh, you know, a budget also for instances of appeal and then indigent Just, capital defense. So that's our budget right so, there. Got it. And with that last line, indigent capital defense, I don't believe you pay into the fund for that anymore. Is that? Uh, so we, uh, 
We had for a long time, but we determined yeah. that we'd prefer to keep that money in the bank and put it into a designated fund as opposed to paying into the uh, insurance pool or whatever. You know, it seems like an insurance type of uh, situation. So what we do is we put the same amount of money that we were putting into the state's indigent capital defense fund, and we just put it into uh, a designated fund, and it builds up. That way we can, you know, build interest on it and uh, that type of, type of thing. Yeah, so we, let's definitely talk about that, too, because there's some benefits to paying into that fund because those cases can be so expensive and last for so long. Yeah. Um, but this is all really helpful and interesting to me to see how you apportion things and the funding. I took a quick screenshot, but I might ask you to send that to me, Chris, also, so we can talk it through. So the next step would really be to schedule a meeting. I think Chris and Mallory um, to talk about these aspects. And Christina, we know that uh, county attorneys and prosecutors shouldn't be opining about public defenders and should, public defenders need to be independent, but we do value the county attorney's perspective, certainly, right? You've been, you're in the courtroom, you're faced with this. So hearing from you is equally as important. So um, let us know, but we've taken a lot of your time. Let's work to set up a future meeting. And we can do that offline with Mallory. Thank you. Anyone else? Very well. Uh, we it is six o'clock. Our oh no, we got four more minutes, so uh, we can go to uh, the presentation on Thompson Springs Town Hall planning efforts. Um, Mark Malcolm uh, Markham uh, called me and said that he was not well and would not be attending. I heard Trish say that Mila was going to say something. He asked me to just give the information for the Thompson Spring Fire Prevention and Community uh, Rejuvenation Meeting, which will be February 9th at 5.30 p.m. And it will be taking place on Zoom. Uh, there's the information there uh, on, you got, I think everyone got the flyer I guess before the ninth, we uh, anyone that's planning on attending, uh, let Mallory know so that I know I will be attending. Uh, and if, you know, just in case we get four people interested, that we can uh, put a, notice it. Is there uh, Mila or uh, Trish? Do you have anything else to add? No, I don't think so. I mean, I think the goal is just to kind of go over some general, um, you know, concerns that Ryan and Evan had from the waste and Mark had been, you know, meeting and touring and Mary and I were out there on a tour. And I think the goal is just to kind of go over the general concerns and possibly some ways to begin to mitigate those concerns. And really the goal is to get public input and buy-in from that community. And so I'll definitely be attending also, Mary. So there's two now. So if anybody else decides they're interested, please let Mallory know. Okay, or Trish and myself. Any other, uh, so we will move. It should be about six, is it? We, uh, we had somebody in the chat room. Uh, Steve and Courtney, Steve uh, Evers and Courtney Kaiser. There you are. Okay, no. uh, try to keep it around three minutes if possible and uh, introduce yourselves. Thank you. Sure, sure, thank you. Hi, I'm Steve Evers and this is Courtney Kaiser. Uh, we're a married couple who live here in Moab for 10 and three years respectively. Like you perhaps, uh, we've seen too many good people get pushed out of this town because they couldn't afford a home. We decided to do something about this by developing the land we live on <clears throat> through the high density housing overlay. We believe the HDHO has been a great idea. However, we are very negatively impacted by a recent change in how it is regulated. So why we're here today, we're asking that our development 
Murphy Flats be regulated by the land use code as it is written, not the rules and regulations for HDHO developments created just yesterday, February 1st. As some of you may know, we've been turning away on Murphy Flats for over two years. We recently submitted all the material required for the final plat approval in mid-December of 2020. The land use code is very clear that anyone can own an HDHO unit so long as the occupant meets the definition of an actively employed household of Grand County. The new rules and regulations now state that both owner and occupants must meet the active employed household definition. So why is this a problem for us? We determine, first, we determine the financial viability of this project with the understanding that non-residents could purchase units so long as a resident occupied it as written in the land use code. Some non-resident buyers will be needed to fund this project. Second, these new rules and regulations have undermined confidence in local buyers. Last week on January 26th, we launched a soft opening for taking unit reservations. As I mentioned in my letter, six units were reserved. We recommended each party to verify their eligibility with, to qualify with the Housing Authority of Southeastern Utah, HASU. What we heard in response from these folks is that they lack the confidence to buy because HASU is using the February 1st new rules and regulations for applications. Those who are interested in buying these homes need to have the security to know that they won't be forced to sell their units if their residency or work situation changes and instead are able to rent it out to another local if needed. This year has certainly highlighted how uncertain things are in the world and knowing that you can keep your house if you lose your job among other scenarios is important to people. We figure there's about a 95% chance that this project collapses if we are not regulated as the land use code states. Before closing, I'd like to paint you a picture of who is affected by this. The people who have expressed a desire to buy a home at Murphy Flats who would otherwise be unable to afford one for a primary home or investment. The teacher from the charter school. The person who works at the hospital on the COVID response team. The engineer from the BLM who designs bridges like the one over Cane Creek at the New Amasa Back Trail Extension. The mountain bike guide who runs a nonprofit with the aim of empowering women worldwide. Another person who emailed us inquiring about buying a home had this to say. I was excited to recently hear about your upcoming development. It seems like it could be exactly what I'm looking for and simultaneously I didn't feel was achievable. Murphy Flats has the potential to put 22 roofs over individuals and families heads by the spring of 2022 and another 12 by the end of 2022. Some will be moving into a home that they actually own by November of this year. We need your help to make this happen. Please allow us to follow the land use code as it is currently written. We ask that you help us provide a realistic opportunity to keep good people here in Moab. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions as well. Uh, thank you very much. I remember your uh, how you spent much time in those uncomfortable chairs during the time that we did the we're working on the OHO. And we, we learned in the last meeting that we could watch from online too <laughs> after we had spent hours. <laughs> so um, is Mila is Mila still on somewhere? Yeah, it looks like she's on. I, mean, I was under the impression that these rules and regulations are just in draft form. Uh, these are in what? draft form and I disagree with a lot of what um, these guys say as much as I like their project. So I do recommend if we want to talk about this more, we go into closed session or deal with this at the end of the meeting. Uh, or I mean, the code does expressly state that uh, it's illegal for any units to be sold to anyone that doesn't qualify. So, you know, we're really- well, I don't, I don't know that it's a closed session item, but I just wanted to point out that these rules and regulations are in draft form. They're not, I don't think anybody should be presenting them as final 
uh, rules and regulations. And no one is. Hasu is not. They don't want to move forward to qualify anyone until we have them complete. All right. And uh, it is your interpretation, Christina, that they will follow the land use code, right? Yeah, of course. Okay. So, so right. then, then is the appropriate time to discuss this? I don't know if it is. I, I feel I need more information myself. Let me, let's uh, take a straw poll from the well, rest. Let me, let me give you a bit more too in terms of time frame. Uh, the plan right now is on February 8th, next Monday, to present the rules and regs to the Planning Commission. Talk about it then, talk about the code, talk about legislative intent. Um, and then to bring the rules and regulations along with the HASU application package that we've worked on um, to the commission for approval on the 16th. So I agree this is all premature. I encourage these guys to speak to the commission because a lot of what they're asking for is a policy change. The entire intent of the, the high density housing overlay is exactly the type of folks that they want to serve. However, that program is gonna collapse if ownership is not the triggered qualification. Um, and in my opinion, that's a, a policy change. We would need to change the ordinance and reconsider all the approvals to date. Um, but I don't think now is the time, and, and I don't think that you know this public meeting is the time. So it sounds like next meeting is the time, you're saying? Yeah, we'll have a lot more information by next meeting. Okay. Yes, and so I want a clarification. I don't know if you can give it to me, Christina or Courtney or uh, whom. Uh, what they're saying they want is that the rentals that you know would be provided rather than to buy them. Is that what you're talking about is having rentals that the people who own the rentals might not live in Moab, but will be renting them to uh, people who work and live in Moab? Is that the hang up? Correct, whether the owner needs to be qualified or merely the occupant needs to be qualified. Yeah, that's okay. correct. We, we that, think that makes, I'm sorry, well, that yeah. makes sense to me. I mean, we want to just provide homes for people who can't afford them. And I don't know, I, would, I, I, will, I will watch the uh, planning commission meeting if I don't have a conflict and uh, see if I can gain some more understanding of what's going on. But I would certainly like to work and have this project come to fruition. I think it's a good project and they put much time and effort into it. So I hope that can happen. Thank you. Thanks all. for your time. Thank you. Mary, I believe um, Emily Campbell is also on for public comment. Oh, yes. hi, Emily. I thought you were just watching. <laughs> Are well, you here? I'm curious, but I have my own comment, not related to any of this. Um, but I do also look forward to um, all of y'all's uh, participation in this conversation going forward. I wanted to make a citizens to be heard comment about noise in Spanish Valley, particularly owing to a Residents actually in San Juan County, but as some of you may be aware, some of the development in Northern San Juan County includes the establishment or potential establishment for a private airport. And um, myself, but also many of my neighbors have noticed significant air traffic over our homes to that airport. And while I know that this body doesn't govern it specifically, um, as the body is working with San Juan County, but also sort of policing the quality of life within our own county boundaries, um, I think this is something you all should be aware of and, um, and interested in. So this used to be very rarely used as the old um, airstrip out, out in Northern Spanish Valley. Recently, uh, as part of the development work that's happening there, and I can't seem to find an update that's more recent than about a year ago, it sounded like some medical or emergency use was permitted as well as the occasional use by parcel companies like UPS. But what we've started to see is pretty much daily usage by private aircraft, including helicopters. A week ago, I had a helicopter fly over my house so low I could read the call signal from my bedroom window. Uh, so well beneath that 500 foot limit. 
And that person who put their call symbol on their helicopter has a habit of sharing their exploits of running their private helicopter around Grand County. So we could pretty quickly find out who it was because he had it on his Instagram. And this is a private, rich entrepreneur who loves to, you know, take his money and spend it and enjoy it, which is fine. But I really don't think he should be breaking the FAA regulations and flying over my home. So as we continue to look at planning in the Southern area, and as we continue to look at relationships between the county, I really hope that the county commission will stay close to this issue because I did not sign up to live near an airport. And I know my neighbors didn't either. My dogs are spooked, my kids are spooked, and I really don't like it. So thank you. Thank you. We do have later on a commission meeting to talk to work how we want to move forward working with the San Juan County Commission. So we should maybe talk about that then. Any other public comment? Um, I see somebody on the line with the last four digits, one, seven, four, one. Are you on for public comment? And if so, please press star six to unmute. Okay, I see um, somebody else on. I'm not sure if it's for public comment, but the last four digits are 1908. If you're on for public comment, please press star six to unmute. Okay. I, I'm just confirming Mary, but I, I think that that is everyone and if those um, phone numbers aren't here for public comment, then I, I think we're good to go at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are to general business action items, discussion and consideration of approving amendment and extension of public defender agreement. Chris Baird. So as I uh, discussed earlier, this will be a month-to-month -month extension uh, with Aaron Wise, uh, who has been our public defender for the last few years. He's doing a great job. This does include a compensation increase. Uh, we haven't renegotiated the contract price for over a decade, and so it's it's time. Um, <clears throat> I will note that the, the contract price is, is really based on a um, public defender uh, manager type of uh, role. And so I did include, um, you know, a requirement in the contract that the um, that uh, Aaron and his company provide consultation to help us through the process of getting that set up and running. You know, and he has expressed an interest in taking on that role eventually. So I think we're moving in the right direction for getting the public defender system in place and getting a managing public defender uh, contract drafted. And so this is an interim solution to make sure that. Um, Aaron is taken care of, uh, that we have a contract for a public defender, and uh, that we can move forward on establishing this uh, system as we should. About a $28,000 a year increase. If I could just weigh in, um, Aaron's really wonderful. Um, his caseload has increased a lot, not just since this contract was assigned, and actually since 2011, which was the last time we increased the public defender contract, the workload has doubled. But his workload has to increase dramatically since I was sworn in and since Matt Brooks joined us, our chief deputy, um, because Matt regularly takes things to preliminary hearings and to trials in a way that my predecessor did not. Um, IDC just educated us a little bit about what effective defense is. And Aaron is a really great public defender. He is out of Spanish Fork. Um, so he does travel to Moab. Um, and I certainly recommend that we approve this contract extension. I also want to make the point that his contract is expired, but there's an hourly rate in there. And I asked him if he billed out at January at the hourly rate, he said it'd be uh, about $12,000 for the month, which is $3,000 more than this increased contract amount. So we get a lot of value out of Aaron. Can I make a motion? Yes, thank you, Kevin. 
I move to approve the amendment and extension of the public defender agreement. Motion by Kevin. Do I have a second? I'll second. Second is, was that Sarah? By yep. Sarah? Uh, discussion. That, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that amendment captures the increase. And uh, what? Yes. Uh, well, the, the contract, the, the increase is built into the contract. So when you're approving the okay. contracts, you're approving that new uh, contract price per month. And Great. so, you know, if the contract were to go a whole year, it would, it would amount to 28000 We're not expecting it to go a whole year. We're going to try to get a new uh, contract in place before the end of the year. But it's probably going to be a similar contract price to this because we're basing this contract price on other contracts that are public uh, defender manager contracts. Okay, I just want to make sure we didn't need to capture any kind of numbers or anything more specific in the motion. No, the contract covers it. Great. That's all I had. Any further discussion? I will call for a vote. All in favor of the motion, say aye. aye. Raise your aye. hand. Aye. Anyone opposed? Motion passes. Motion passes. Uh, uh, unanimously. Thank you. Approving volunteer uh, appointments to the uh, Economic Diversification Advisory Council. Uh, they there were some problems with getting the the time frame to get those questions answered and turned in, and so it was discussed and I think it would be best to postpone this until the next meeting. Uh, so moved. Okay, the, I made the motion to postpone until the next meeting. Do I have a second? Second. Ga seconded by Gabriel, discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Passes unanimously. Approving budget amendment to fund 23, uh, for fund 23, excuse me. Uh, Travel Council, Chris Baird. Okay, so um, this is uh, in coordination with Commissioner Walker and uh, we've also worked with Elaine Gisler on this um, proposed amendment. So what this would do, we have a, uh, a line item called advertising. I mean, technically, I think that this type of expenditure would still fit within that line item, but we wanted to delineate um, some of this promotion specifically for, for responsible trail promotion. And I listed out, you know, a, a few of the uh, types of ideas that were provided to me in the agenda summary um, to be to sort of out or delineating more uh, accurately some of the expenditures um, for promotion and uh, just, you know, to help guide yeah. Lane and the advertising committee and how to spend that money. So it's just a transfer from one line item to another. I mean, technically, these kinds of things could be done between the department head and the budget officer, um, but it's, you know, I, I felt like this was a, a large enough shift uh, to bring to the commission for approval. Anybody have any questions or comments? Questions? Uh, I, <clears throat> I would just comment that uh, I agree that the responsible trail promotion could easily fit under the advertising. Um, line and I'm just wondering if there's any kind of uh, risk from uh, the powers that be upstate if we separate these two. I don't think so. I mean the technical the code technically says that we can use the money for the establishment and promotion of tourism, recreation, film and conventions. So this would fit pretty squarely in my opinion under the promotion and establishment of recreation. You know, Great. as per our most recent, uh, recently passed policy regarding advertising in Grand County. 
Do I have any further questions? So just for clarification, so the, these are TRT monies, Chris? Yeah, just, TRT. And, and this is this is money that traditionally we go to promoting Moab in things like TV advertisements or billboards or, or what have you in the past? Uh, ask that again. You kind of broke up in the beginning, Shock. All right, Chris. So th this is money that traditionally would have been used to promote Moab and in, in things such as billboards or TV advertising and, and that type of stuff in the past. That's right. So more precisely, you know, TRT money is divided into promotion and mitigation pieces, and this is the promotion piece. Um, I just wanted to remark that this is sort of a continuation of a process that started, I think, in 2019, when the council appointed a, some kind of committee to work with federal land managers to come up with ideas. And that committee did meet, and they came up with a lot of ideas you see on the agenda summary. And so now we're two years later taking the next step to try to actually spend some of this money on these things. I, I think it's a little bit of it. I agree. Kevin, can you tell me, so is this land managers or were there businesses that are producing TRT? Oh, sorry, saying it. Hang on. Thanks, Mary. Can you hear me better now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I'm better. just wondering on that committee, was it just land managers or were businesses involved in that committee? I'm um, just wondering uh, if, you know, businesses and did, are also pulled. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Make a motion. Yes. Thank you, Sarah. I move to approve moving 274,000 from account 2342420200000 advertising to account 2342359200006 for responsible trail promotion. Motion by Sarah. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Kevin. Motion seconded by Kevin. Further discussion. I just wanted to say that I'm particularly excited about the prospect of local students and local artists being involved in some of these efforts. I am too. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, and I guess I do, I do want to further comment, and this is maybe a, a future consideration item that now that we've created this budget line item, you know, it's not, the money isn't going to automatically spend itself. I think we need to, um, you know, do some work or a, yeah, you know, so, someone's got to help make these things happen. So that'll be the subject in future meetings, I expect. It's exciting. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Anyone opposed? Passes unanimously. And that was, the motion was made by Sarah and seconded by Kevin. Okay, approving volunteer appointments to the Public Health Board midterm vacancy, Vice Chair uh, Gabriel Wojtek. All right, so this is the Public Health Board um, that pertains to the Southeastern Utah Health Department, um, which meets every other month. Um, we had a, 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 a vacancy created by the departure of Steve Hawks when him and Jay Lynn left town. Um, and so we received one applicant, Brianne Davis. Um, and uh, she, it was uh, unanimous, unanimously recommended by the board for approval, uh, her appointment. That's all. Okay. Sarah? I move to approve the midterm appointment of Brianne Davis to serve as the public health board with the term expiring, 1231-22. I'll second. Thank you, Sarah. Seconded by Jacques. Motion by Sarah, seconded by Jacques. Uh, do we have any further question? Okay, I'll call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Passes unanimously. Approving Additional 2021 assignments of the county commission represented liaisons to the districts and county board commissions and committees and other agencies. 
Uh, Chair McGann, uh, the Grand County Economic Diversity Advertising Council. This was not on our original list. Uh, is there anyone interested? Was it one or two, Chris? I don't remember that we had to have on the, uh, the chem count, uh, from the commission. I think it was one. Is there a commissioner who would be interested in working on the Economic Diversification Advisory Council? Is there any word on scheduling for this or it all has yet to be done? It all has to be done with, uh, once we get a committee in place and the committee will probably come up with the times and the place, which would be Zoom at this point. I feel like I have a pretty light load and I should probably step up unless somebody is very interested. I, I'm, I also have interests, so, um, okay. but I also, I, I'm sort of, I'm taking the lead in, in, in terms of this regional economic development in terms of being at the table. And I do see a lot of value also in, in pulling in other commissioners for these types of efforts. So I don't necessarily um, want to be, don't necessarily see the need to be territorial about it. So maybe we can see how the scheduling works out and kind of go from there. Sure. Shall um, yeah. Or should we uh, make a motion? Uh, let me get to the next. Uh, I mean, I'd be happy to pass it off to you, Gabe, at any point if you want it. So we could just motion to have me be it for now. Yes. Is okay. that? So does somebody want to make? Been, I would. Say and uh, Sarah's appointment to the Grand County Economic Diversification Advisory Council. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Kevin. Do we have discussion? Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? passes unanimously. Utah Association of County Board of Directors. Uh, every uh, county has a commissioner assigned to attend these boards of directors. I think it's a bi-monthly, it used to be a bi-monthly thing. Uh, Chris Kaufman is on it for the Treasures Association since he's pre president of it. Is there anyone is interested in being on the Utah Association of County Boards of Directors? Is, is that a position going forward after after um, COVID? Potentially, it would involve travel to the meetings. I I don't I don't know. I think what they're finding out with some of these Utah things that uh, the Zoom's almost working better because it doesn't cost the commission counties as much. Because because they don't have to pay for travel and a motel room. But I think they will probably make that decision once COVID is kind of, you know, passed, hopefully soon. Well, so I think, I, I think remote participation has always been an option. Um, yeah. Not necessarily as effective if everybody else is there in, per in person. But I remember yep. attending some of these meetings um, remotely, you know, years ago. I, would you be I, have, I have I have willingness um, and to a certain degree I'm already kind of rubbing shoulders with some of these actors and it might it might uh, it might make sense in some respects um, with regards it being to it to it being aligned with uh, how I'm plugging into the AOG uh, conversation. That makes sense. Uh, Jay Lynn did it before because she was AOG and it, it felt like a glove. She did have a, a coal in case she couldn't make it. And so I was the coal or the, you know. So- uh, you take that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind um, being the, the co-position. I could, I could uh, handle that. Do you want to make, make a motion? Go ahead, Jacques. Uh, <laughs> nominate yourself. <laughs> uh, 
Okay. I'll move to to nominate myself, Jacques Hadler, as the uh, uh, co-commissioner to the UAC Board of Directors. Do I have a second? Before Wait. we, I think we want also want to does add Gaben there as the main. Jacques, will you nominate me, please? No. <laughs> nominate Gabe as the uh, Grand County Commissioner uh, representative to the UAC Board of Directors, and myself as the. Uh, co-commissioner to the UAC Board of Directors. Okay, okay. seconded okay. by Kevin. Uh, discussion? Call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Passes unanimously. We're to adopting ordinance approving vacation of the of the port vacate of the portion of the seven mile flat road number 1940, a County D road located through real property known as parcel number 0400 or 0020000008 and 04-XST-00067, Christina Sloan. Can I make the motion? Hmm? Excuse me? Robin, you want a motion before we I'll, say I'll make the motion. Just oh, it wasn't Christine. It was it was Christina and Bill Jackson. Okay, let, let me make the motion first, just to get that out of the way. I, I move to adopt the proposed ordinance vacating, vacating the portion of Seven Mile Flat Road number 1940, the County D Road located through your property known as 545 West State Route 313, Moab, Utah, parcel numbers 42088 and 4XST67, owned by Red Earth Venue LLC and Intrepid, Intrepid Potash Moab LLC. There would be motion by Kevin. Do I have a second? Seconded by Jacques. Okay, it doesn't look like Bill is here. Um, you guys had a point. He's here. He's here. Oh, great. Bill, do I'm you here. Have a present? Here. Yes. Take it away, Bill. Well, as y'all recall, we uh, had a public hearing on uh, January 19th, 2021. This is the, the Follow up. I think we had a few comments, uh, at least one from Rick York, who represents uh, the property owner of uh, Intrepid Potash. And now we're here today to uh, once again to follow up with that and get approval of the ordinance to vacate the D road. Any questions? Well, Question? Two details I want to point out is that this is a dead end road. It's through what's been historically Intrepid uh, Potash property. They did sell the front piece um, and it has been gated off from the public for approximately 40 years. So there has not been public use and it is a dead end road. Um, I just had a question about, I heard that Intrepid might be selling the property or I, I just wondered if this is partially, if there's like plans from a future developer that this might aid or like if there's more information known. Um, only information, yeah, the only information I know is that they've sold off the front piece to the Hayes family, who, as I understand, is going to be operating weddings, those types of sort of scenic events out there. But I don't know of any, uh, you know, development of any intensity. Did somebody already make the second? Yeah, I, I believe so. Yeah, Jacques seconded. Bill, it's unlike you to uh, want to give up roads here. Well, uh, you know, it is a D road, which is a, a unmaintained county road, and it hasn't been in use for quite some time. Uh, you know, we do not maintain them. Uh, on private you... property, uh, no one's really going to be affected. I have not over the years, I've never heard any comments about not being the public not being able to access that, access that road or that property due to the locked gate. Um, 
So I, yeah, I, don't, I don't have any heartburn over it. I just hope uh, the headlines don't read that uh, Bill Jackson closes roads in Grand County tomorrow. Well, it's not the first time that a D road's been vacated. So. And I think, uh, to be honest with you, I think we can look, be, uh, be looking in the future to have more of these uh, uh, as the development uh, kind of goes north of here, down in the 313 area. Okay. Yeah, I, I'd be curious about the, the gate that was there, but uh, I think that's a discussion another time. Um, we'll see in some other roads that got gated around the county recently. Um, I'm not aware of any, any others. Yeah. Can we get everybody to mute their mic if they're not speaking? The dogs are barking. It's hard to hear. Okay. I got no um, discussions. So we had a motion by Kevin nope. and seconded by Jacques. Uh, do we have any further discussion? I just had one comment, just that I'm really appreciative of the level of detail provided in maps and photographs for this item. Made it really easy um, to illustrate what was going on here without, you know, save, saved a site visit potentially. Yes, thank you. A any further comments? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Passes unanimously. Now we are approving, approving right-of-way agreement with the Bureau of Land Management for Moon Ridge Road, number two, uh, 209, UTU-96371, and Steer Ridge Road number 211 UTU-94847. Glenn Arthur. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Both of these roads were uh, maintained, or not maintained, but were built by National Fuel Corporation for a, to a well site. The National Fuels has been in and uh, taken the plugged the wells and cleaned all their materials off of them. And the road department takes these over and maintains them to uh, be able to allow people good camping spots, hunting spots, you know, sightseeing, whatever they would, you know, could find a use for the these well sites and the access roads to them. And that one of them's a mile long, the Moon Ridge is a mile, and Steer Ridge is approximately a half mile. Questions or a motion? I'll just make a comment really quick, Mary. I spent a lot of time in that country, and it's well, true, like those roads are oh, Turn off. Sorry, your... sorry. <laughs> there we go. Sorry. Hello. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, Mary. I'll just state I, I spent a lot of time on in that country and on those roads, and, and they're heavily used by recreationists. Um, so I would encourage maintaining those roads by the county. Madam Chair, I, yes. would, move, I would move to approve the right of way agreements with the Bureau of Land Management for Moon Ridge Road, number 209. And dash nine six three seven one and Steer Ridge Road, number two eleven UTU dash nine four eight four seven. Uh, do I have a second? Second. I'll if second. I can. Uh, do any further discussion? See no. We'll give Bill some more roads. Oh. <laughs> uh, see no. I call for a vote. All in favor. Aye. Aye. All opposed? Passes unanimously. Kevin, we're, we're looking at a no net loss. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we're pre approving enterprise lease schedules. Cody McKinnon, fleet manager, and Chris Baird. So, um, one of the things that we kind of realized is that. Um, 
purchasing vehicles kind of re requires that we be able to jump on opportunities as they arrive. COVID has kind of made it made vehicles a little less available than they used to be. And so waiting two weeks to get something approved, I think is gonna be problematic. And so what I'm proposing is to pre-approve uh, certain lease schedules. <clears throat> um, that way, when vehicles become available that meet our needs, uh, they can just go ahead and purchase them and establish the lease schedule for them. Um, one thing I'd like to amend, and I sent out an email to everybody, um, this, the original motion is to pre-approve uh, the vehicles for the sheriff's office, um, but I'd like to add in approving the vehicles for the uh, senior center, our uh, 15 passenger, passenger van that we used to use for transporting seniors to doctor's appointments, et cetera, has been broken down. And so I'd like to get that purchased and uh, back up and running as soon as possible. So I sent an email with a new motion, and so I'd prefer if you make that motion uh, instead of the original. I'm willing to get that motion on the floor. Thank you, Gabriel. I move to pre-approve enterprise lease schedules for up to 20 sheriff's office vehicles with equipment and not to exceed $180,000 per year and one 15 passenger van and one half ton truck for the Grand Center not to exceed $22,476 per year. Thank you, Gabriel. Do I have a second? Seconded by Kevin, thank you. Discussion. Uh, Chris, are you familiar with uh, the style of vehicles for the Sheriff's Office? I think they're all, all gonna be half ton, right Kyle? Half ton trucks? Yes, uh, they're all half ton trucks. We're working closely with uh, Premier um, to get those equipped as soon as we're able to uh, source them. Great. Uh, I was, uh, there was some national news uh, this year about the new administration transitioning the entire federal fleet over to electric vehicles. And um, I was really impressed by that. And I hope that as we, uh, kind of tick off some of these high needs vehicles that when we get down to the Impalas and some of the other smaller cars, uh, Kyle, do we have the option to uh, uh, include electric vehicles in our fleet? Yes, of course. Um, that's a common question that's coming up right now and uh, rightfully so, you know, especially with all the uh, sustainability efforts you guys are um, putting forth. I'm not surprised that you would be looking at uh, electric vehicles. So um, it's definitely something that is on a lot of my clients uh, radar and you definitely have the ability to uh, go with electrical vehicles if you choose. Are there any, uh, I don't want to sidestep Cody here, but are there any uh, comparable uh, trucks online now? Uh, for electric vehicles? Yeah. Uh, not quite, not, not any that I would recommend. So there are electric vehicles and electric trucks. I'm sure you guys have seen the cyber truck come out with Tesla. There's a couple different um, other. I'm entities. sure the sheriff would like those windshields. That was, uh... <laughs> yeah. As long as they don't, they don't crack. Huh? <laughs> uh, right. I, I, I get that, but um, I would definitely be interested before we approve any of the other like uh, sedans and that sort of stuff, maybe not for cruisers, but our, airport vehicles and, and that, that um, I would be interested in seeing options for that. Yeah, we can definitely assist with uh, helping you look at the numbers that way. Thanks. Thank you, Evan. Any further discussion or questions? Call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Passes unanimously. We are to approving independent contractor agreement with EFG Consulting LLC uh, for an eternal audit annual services. Cody, I think Cody said he couldn't be here. Yeah, it, we can cover it. So this is just uh, the contract for our, our uh, internal auditor, um, which is um, required by the state auditor's office. So. Um, it's pretty typical that we would establish contracts with um, annual renewal option for up to five years. So we had Cody draft the contract uh, according to those terms. But besides that, it's really just a renewal of the contract we had last year with them. And so um, this would be establishing 
a new contract that we could renew annually up to five for up to five years before we have to re reinitiate the process per whatever um, purchasing policy we have in place at that time five years from now. And I think and having go ahead. And it, you know the the renewal option doesn't have to be taken um, annually. It's just there if we if we so choose. On being on the uh, that committee, uh, I see some great asset to being able for the continuity, because like they do the work, they 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 start to know the county. Uh, I think it, you know, and then we can look at it, you know, in five years if we want to, or even next year. But I think having the ability to do a continuing contract is very important. Well, Mary, you make a persuasive case, so in response, I will make a motion. I move to approve the independent, independent contractor agreement with EFG Consulting LLC for the Internal Auditor Annual Services. A second. Uh, so the motion, who said, was that you, uh, Jacques, that seconded? It was. Okay, motion by Kevin, second by Jacques. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I call for a vote. Uh, all in favor, say aye or raise your hand or vote. Aye. Anyone opposed? Passes unanimously. Approving reorganization, reorganizing the Old Spanish Trail Arena, OSTA, Business coordinating co coordinator, excuse me, grade seven to the OSTA administrative assistant, grade five, and approving recruitment and hiring. Renee Baker. Sure. Um, Mary, I also have Angie Book, who is our new OSTA director. Um, I believe she's on as well. The intent with this is it's not creating a new position, it's taking Angie's position that was kind of upped in 2019. Um, back down to its original intent of being an uh, administrative support position. Um, the greatest place with all the other admin assistants, admin assistants across the county. Um, and we should see some savings within the budget on this as well. That's good. Questions? I'd entertain a motion. Sounds great to me. I move to approve the reorganization of the OSTA business coordinator at grade seven to the OSTA administrative assistant at a grade five and approve the recruitment and hiring of the administrative assistant position effective February 3rd, 2021. Second. Moved by Jacques, seconded by Kevin. Discussion? Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, so does this... I don't know if Renee can provide any more insight about um, is this just have to do with different skill sets of the new administration up there or um, a change in philosophy up at OSTA in general or is there any more sort of insight as to this sort of uh, change back? Yeah, absolutely. And Angie can, and can add to this if she'd like. Um, really, when we created the business coordinator position, it was to help... Um, with the budget and it was the position that Angie was holding um, to help with the budget and the events kind of coordination side of, of OSTA, which Angie feels like she has a pretty good grasp on, can, can continue to be a, a member within that kind of realm, um, but really needs somebody who can, can do the administrative day-to-day -day type of things. So that's where the kind of change in philosophy, I guess, would be. Great, thanks Angie. Any further questions? Call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? No. Okay, thank you. Uh, approving uh, clarification and temporary restructuring of budget advisory board member term expiration. Uh, Chris Baird. So I mean, long story short, I think we got a little off from the bylaws of this uh, uh, budget committee. I mean, uh, Tara can give more details if you need them, but this motion would just get us back on track with the bylaws 
and uh, sort of the intent of this membership. We kind of got a year off because I think um, one of the minutes was uh, approved incorrectly, and so it kind of threw things off a bit. Did um, anyone ask if Chris and Elaine are willing to extend their terms? I did, oh. and they both are. I mean, it's the term I think that they signed up for. Um, so we're just kind of um, establishing, again, you know, like I say, getting back on, on track with the bylaws. And I think the original motion was accurate. It's just the minutes reflecting that motion was inaccurate. And I don't know if it's worth, you know, really going back and fixing the minutes. We can just fix it right now with this motion and be fine. Sounds good. I move to extend the Budget Advisory Board appointment of Chris Kaufman and Elaine Gisler uh, to December 31st, 2021. Second. Thank you, Sarah. Seconded by Kevin. Further discussion? All in favor? Say aye. Raise your hand. Aye. Anyone opposed? Passes unanimously. Okay, we are to item Q, adopting resolution approving, uh, how do you say that? Pesto de Sol phase uh, 12, final plat for real property known as parcel number 02-0015-0001. Mila. All right, uh, so this is uh, phase 12 for Puesta del Sol PUD. Um, they're almost done. I think there's one more phase. Uh, this phase only contemplates one lot. Uh, it's one single family residential lot uh, up in the northeast corner of the subdivision. Um, there are no uh, subdivision improvements agreement necessary. The uh, potential lot owner has arranged everything via easements and gotten it all approved with the utilities. Um, the preliminary plat for the Puesta del Sol PUD was originally approved by the County Council in 1996. And this lot uh, has been on that plat or on the preliminary plat since the beginning. Um, there are not anything else that's unusual. Uh, it is included in the CCNRs for the subdivision uh, and it will continue to be so. Question or a motion? All right, sounds like a slam dunk. I'll move to approve the final plat for the Puesto del Sol PUD phase 12 for real property known as parcel number 02-0015-0001. Thank you, Jacques. Do I have a second? Seconded by Kevin. Discussion. A call for a motion, uh, call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Where to are? Approving independent contractor agreement between Housing Authority of Southeastern Utah, HASU, and Grand County for administration of high density housing overlay program. Mila? All right. Uh, so, this is the independent contractor agreement um, to allow HASU to do the qualification of households for the HDHO units and lots. Uh, there's $20,000 uh, that has already been budgeted for this administration. Um, they'll be evaluating the qualification documents um, and approving owners and renters for uh, HDHO units, um, as well as working closely with the county for continuing enforcement. Thank you. Uh, yes, Sarah? I move to approve the independent contractor agreement between Hasu and Grand County for the administration of high density housing overlay program. Thank you. Do we have a uh, seconded by Evan? So motion by Sarah, seconded by Evan. Questions or discussion? All in favor, say aye. Aye, raise your hand. All opposed? Passes unanimously. 
Approving letter to vehicle manufacturers requesting responsible advertising. Uh, I just want to, uh, uh, this came up because when I, my husband was watching a lot of uh, football, I was seeing advertisements where uh, the one that was the most abrasive was a Chevrolet advertisement where they said uh, the, the truck was driving up a road like it was in an Alpine area. And they say, not only can you go up in possible roads, you can make your own. And then the truck turned off the road and headed off into a pristine area. So it just floored me. I called Elaine and talked to her about it and she thought it was a good idea for us to at least write the manufacturers and tell them we're not happy with that type of advertising. And then to Elaine's credit, I have to say, I could not have probably done this without her. She immediately found all the emails and such for the manufacturer's advertising department so that we'd have some place to send it. So that's the history and, and thank you, Sarah, for your uh, you know, editing and changing of the letter. I do think you're right. I always appreciate that. Discussion, yes, Kevin? Uh, I was gonna make a motion. Okay, good. Um, I move to approve the letter to the vehicle manufacturers advertising departments requesting responsible advertising. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second by Jacques? Discussion? Yeah. Are we just sending it to manufacturers that we found were advertising irresponsibly, or are we just doing a blanket? I'm a little unclear on that. I think we're kind of doing a blanket. I've seen a couple. The most offensive was the Chevrolet, but I did see something with, from Toyota once. And so I think just letting them know that we don't want people being encouraged to go off the road. I, I think this is a great idea and I'm, I thank you for taking the initiative to do it. And I'm glad Elaine was able to help make it more effective. Yeah. Yeah, me, me too, Mary. Thanks. I think it's a, it's a great letter and I'm proud to sign it. I think, yes, yeah, especially now with the automaker, automakers themselves, um, you know, making their commitments to turning over their manufacturing to EV um, and just them obviously being aware of their impact. I think it's a good time to sort of think about as well how they can message the use of the vehicles. Even even like, a, a, you know, I think the, there was an electric Hummer ad that started coming out, I think it was last fall. And I, I can't recall if in the ad itself that what they were encouraging or not, but um, even, a, even a vehicle, you know, that is, uh, an EV, it doesn't, it, just because it's an electric vehicle doesn't mean it, it uh, can't uh, destroy the wilderness off trail. So um, I think oftentimes, I think it, it can lead to um, sort of the industry sort of letting down their guard in that respect. And I think sometimes these advertising people or city people and probably don't even use the vehicles that are advertising and, and don't recognize that their, that advertisement is inappropriate. So hopefully we can educate him. Um, Any further discussion? Yeah, you know, I, I know that the uh, uh, Film Commission and others, probably the Travel Council as well, have have worked to recruit um, some of these manufacturers to film these kind of advertisements, and not these kinds of advertisements, but to film advertisements in Grand County. And I wonder if there would be a place for a single sentence someplace about, we'd like to partner with you in uh, filming or planning appropriate messaging and would love to have you film here in Grand County or something. Um, I, th I think I don't want our pushback against the, the message to be uh, fully off-putting to to them as a business. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. That makes yeah, a lot I, of, I, I like agree that. with. I yeah. like that. 
I'm going to agree with Evan on this. I mean, obviously, I don't want vehicles off trail or, or off road and making their own trails. But there were parts of that letter that were somewhat off putting to me. And I think that there's a way, especially if they're, they haven't actually done an advertisement like this to be, it's kind of like, you need to stop. I mean, well, there was one sentence in there that it's like, you need to stop. And it's like, but if they haven't actually done something like that. So I think if there's a way to say, hey, we're encouraging this type of advertising, we're encouraging this type of filming, something that's just a little more, a little softer. Uh, I just think a that, slightly I think. softer, I think that would be my opinion on that also. Well, I'm totally comfortable with that. I would make one or one or two suggestions. We could, this is not timely. So if we want to kind of tweak the letter and approve it next time, we could do that. Or uh, someone could make a motion that we will approve the letter with the suggestions to... Uh, kind of encourage uh, advertisers to come to Moab and to soften the language. So we could go either way, I would think. That's just my thoughts. I would approve the letter to the vehicle, or I guess, did we already have a motion? Sorry, is this a substitute motion? No. Yeah, yeah motion by Kevin, seconded by Jacques. Okay, yeah. I, would make, I would make a substitute motion to approve the letter to vehicle manufacturers uh, advertising departments requesting responsible advertising with the edits discussed regarding partnership and future filming opportunities in Grand County. Thank you. Thank you. I think those are both really good, good suggestions. I appreciate it. Uh, there's substitute motion on the floor by Evan. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Seconded by Trish. Further discussion. I, like I said, I mean, I think just like uh, even just one sentence to balance it out a little, I think would uh, go a long way. Maybe, yes. maybe the second to last paragraph there um, about uh, should stress the importance of respect for the land and environmental stewardship. We'd love to. Blah, well, yes, yeah, send, send those ideas and we'll get them and then I'll do a better job of getting it to you before we get it on the, so everybody can look at it and feel comfortable. Yeah. Okay, we have a substitute. Uh, Evan made the substitute uh, and then Trish seconded it, substitute motion. Any further discussion? All in favor of the substitute motion? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Too many new so it's all, all vote against. <laughs> okay, so we have, uh, it passes six to one with uh, Kevin Walker in opposition. Okay, uh, proving statement of opposition to House Bill 82, accessory dwelling units, uh, 98 building and planning review and in, inspections, 195 vehicle registration, and Senate Bill 44 payment in lieu of tax funds, and 61 electric billboards, uh, and support of House Bill 247, Christina Sloan. Okay, what I'm asking for here is an official position from the commission about certain bills. And the reason for that is so that both you guys can use that official position and lobbying with legislators, but also I can use it and staff can use it. Um, for our new commissioners, as you probably learned at your orientation, um, our council bylaws, commission bylaws, um, recommend strongly that you do not speak for the commission as a body and that you make your own personal opinions um, clear unless there's an official position. So this is not something we've historically done um, to support and oppose bills. And this is just week three of our six week session. So I would expect to come back to you and ask for a second round later if I can continue to keep up. Um, 
but this is to create an official position. There are hundreds and hundreds of bills out there. I have picked a few that I think are very concerning and should be on your radar and also very uniquely impact Grand County or counties in general. And therefore I've included it here. Um, there might be other ones out there. I do actually have two additional related bills that I'll talk about that are related to two other subjects here that I'd like to add to the list. Um, so I'm just looking for a simple motion. And then the, the suggested motion authorizes the chair to sign letters later. So if we decide we wanna actually put together um, a letter with some flourish, we can do that let later and you're authorizing Mary to sign those letters. The general session moves so fast that most lobbying is done by text and by phone. So I don't actually expect to use any written letters, um, but just so you know, we can do that later. So the bills that I wanted you to be aware of are those that are in your agenda summary. House Bill 82, this is Representative Ward's bill. This is one of two ADU bills that are very similar. So the other bill that's come out since I drafted this on ADUs is House Bill 273, which has a different sponsor Peterson, but they're very similar and they both chip away at local control. And that's something that I think we need to continue to push back on the state legislature every chance we get. So um, these are bills that both prohibit cities and counties from regulating ADUs at all. Now, I think we all, I think everyone on this commission can appreciate that ADUs are an integral component to affordable housing program. Um, but we still want some control over parking, for example, or maybe want, we want some control over the size of the ADU relatively, relative the, to the primary residence. This HB 82 is specific to all ADUs and this new HB 273 is specific to internal ADUs. So ADUs in a basement, for example, or within the home. Um, but both of them would prohibit us from requiring a parking space for an ADU. Both of them would require frontage on a road, if that's something we wanted to require. Um, I know HB 273 also prohibits us from charging an impact fee to hook up a new unit, a new kitchen to, you know, a water or sewer system. Um, those are ADU bills. The second one, HB 98. This one is being massively opposed by UAC, but also ULCT, the, the city equivalent. Um, and yet what I'm learning is even UAC and ULCT, as powerful as those lobbies are, they, have, they can't defeat bad bills by themselves. And so HB 98 is one that UAC has put out a priority call to all of its members and all of its commissioners to reach out to our legislator, legis, legislators to try to defeat. And this one's really broad and sweeping and it would allow developers to exempt around our planning review process and also our building inspector process and bring in their own inspector. So they have to go through some process, but clearly there would be some um, bias of a, you know, a person working for the developer. Um, that one's being universally opposed, not just by Bill Holz, our building inspector and Mila, but also um, the fire district and our fire chief. Uh, HB 195, Representative Robertson. This is the only bill so far that we have specific to um, ADUs that concerns me. We're still waiting, by the way, for Senator McKell's bill on ADUs. We don't have that. That's something we hope to support. That's the one that, you know, McKell is, is but, running for us. I think you meant ATV, right? Yeah, what did I say? ADU. Yes, thank you. ATVs. Um, this one's innocuous, but when you get into it, what he's asking for is that the decals on license plates, and that's all vehicle license plates, go away. So you still have to register your car, but you no longer have any physical proof on your license plate. Well, that's actually wide reaching for law enforcement, period. And it, uh, you know, right now there's a visual cue if law enforcement sees a license plate that is expired, that's probable cause to pull someone over. And, and sometimes it leads to, you know, additional drug arrest. And, and DUIs and stuff like that. Um, under this bill, they'd still have the right to run a license plate, but they'd have to run every single license plate to determine who is registered and who isn't. And one reason that's important for ATVs is because right now, as state law is currently written, ATV licensing is one of the only things we have to concretely um, regulate street legal ATVs in Moab. Um, Senate Bill 44, Senator Fillmore, 
Uh, this is a really bad bill that relates to payment in lieu of taxes. The PILT funds are what we receive for the federal government instead of property taxes. And of course, this bill um, will dramatically increase rural counties with high percentage of federal public lands like ours. Some people um, describe PILT, that acronym, as meaning pennies in lieu of taxes because that's how low the tax payment is from the federal government. This would create a new state program and state fund where the state would take all the PILT money. They'd only pay us up to a certain cap paid by the federal government, and then they would take the rest of the funds for other um, you know, great programs like schools and other special service districts, but we already are funding those entities as well. Um, and so counties are 100% opposed to this pill bill. There's also some federal legal concerns um, that the county attorney group has brought up. And so we're working through that as well. The fiscal note on this one shows that we'd lose millions of dollars, not Grand County, but rural Utah would lose millions of dollars over a period of years as a result. Um, Senate Bill 61 is, so there's two really bad billboard bills. And so we have Senate Bill 61 here and the other one that's been proposed since is Senate Bill 144 with our own Senator Hinkins. Well, Senator Hinkins, I was gonna yes. bring that in. I'm so disappointed. Um, but I also think that, you know, Sen Senator Hinkins is a good listener and I do hope to uh, talk this one over with him. The Sandals bill is even worse. Okay, this is one that would prohibit us from prohibiting a billboard being converted into electronic billboard. So again, it's chipping away at local control. It expressly violates our dark skies ordinance, but they don't care. So it would override our local ordinance and it would require if a billboard order wanted to go electric, we'd have to let them. And then Hankins new bill um, imposes various uh, prohibitions on city and county governments from regulating billboards. Um, it doesn't have an electronic component, but it does attempt to take away local control of billboard regulation. So those are the ones I recommend we oppose. And then support is the HB 247, the big TRT bill. Chris has been working really hard on this. Um, he certainly can give you an update now or later, but this is something um, we've years in the making and Representative Albrecht has been really great working with us. Um, Casey's been a big asset, our private lobbyist. This is where, um, you know, Chris and I have really focused his time is working on this. At the same time, we have Casey, but Chris is doing a ton of work and I've also done a ton of work on the TRT bill. Um, but we're getting, we're, we're, we're hopeful that, that we're gonna create a carve out for Grand County that will increase our flexibility and allow us to use some of the promotional side for economic development. And so do we wanna add that house, oh, I, I just lost it, the house, the one from Hinkins, 144, do we wanna add that to the list? Yeah, I'd like to add House Bill 273, that's the other ADU bill, and then Senate Bill 144. And I'm not finding it right now and I feel real foolish because I've been working on it. But we did send the resolution, so I don't think it matters. But uh, right now, independent uh, commissioners, I'll, I'll, I'll email that number uh, if they could support the Utah Rafter uh, bill by contacting the committee that will be hearing about it, the Appropriations Committee. And we should add that. We could add it instead by, uh, by bill number, just it would be sufficient to describe it and we could add that to our support. Okay, because uh, the CITLA right now, which is real frustrating last year, they were willing to trade land. And this year they decided they wanted to charge make uh, the state parks or make a uh, house and Senate vote to pay Sitla for the Willow Springs area. I did talk to Brian Torgerson today and he says they're really willing to uh, work with us. They're willing to do either a partnership with the state and do a fee revenue. They're willing to do some trade outs. So it wasn't as bad as I thought when I first talked. I will be talking to the head of CITLA tomorrow, telling them that we don't want with that. If that dollar sign stays in the amount of money they want for that area, it will kill the park. It won't happen. 
So, you know, we have to we'll be lob I'll be lobbying Sitla a lot to try to get them to pull that and do a trade with sovereign lands is willing to do a trade with them for some land near Cisco or or do something that uh, Sitla wanted to do with us, which was a partnership where we share the rent. We run the, anyway, it was a revenue sharing. And so they, start, they said they'd be willing to do that. So hopefully we can get that, the cost of the bail down. It's HB 257. Oh, thank you. You're faster than 257. I'm getting real slick on the legislature page. I learned a lot. It um, is. Okay, uh, Gabriel. Um, I would um, be happy to make a motion. Thank you. Um, I move to oppose House Bills 82, 98, 195, and 243, and Senate Bills 44 and 61 and 144, and support House Bill 247, as well as House Bill 257, and authorize the chair to sign any necessary letters of opposition or support to Utah legislators deemed necessary by the county commission administrator or county attorney. Great, and I didn't hear House Bill 273, the second ADU bill in the opposition, but you may have said it and I missed it. Oh, uh, I think I said 243 instead of 273. I meant to say, um, yes, uh, so, House Bill 273 instead of two, House Bill 243. Seconded by Kevin. Further discussion. Uh, I know this is very amazing to see this uh, presented so well. I know that we've tried to do a lot of bill tracking in the past and there were spreadsheets and weirdness and it required it a lot of homework. And so, uh, um, this is uh, really helpful for me to have it laid out this way. I also know that some of the reasons that we didn't, uh, or why we struggled to take stances in the past was because some of these bills uh, would change so much. So um, I like the per vote on January 28th or these kind of dates that are like, hey, on this day, the way it was written, we didn't like it. Um, and I was wondering if we needed something like that on the Robertson's bill uh, regarding the uh, registration requirements. Um, is that likely to change or is that pretty much the meat of the bill and if it survives in any way? Um, so far, I have not heard of any proposed changes to that one. I will say that the Sheriff's uh, Association is opposed they would be the ones uh, more than the county attorney group to work on any proposed amendments, but I haven't seen one to that one. Okay. Now this is, this is awesome. I'm Thank very, you. very appreciative of everyone's work on this. It feels really good. And uh, I hope to see more of it. Thank As you. things unfold. I'm also really psyched that we don't have to go up to Salt Lake to pound the marble and to make these oh. things. And that you can be in the committee meetings via yeah. Zoom rather than having to drive up there. It's it's a real benefit. Yeah, it's been amazing. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, we'll call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Okay, uh, passes unanimously. Approving execution of a assessed easement agreement for 540 East, 100 North, Moab, Utah. Chris Baird. So this one is uh, the second part of uh, the motion that was made earlier in the MBA meeting. So we're just approving that shared access easement to be approved and recorded um, so we can get going on our application with the city to move forward on the EMS new facilities project. And so thanks to Christina for putting this together and, uh, and working it out. 
Madam Chair, I would move to approve the access easement across county property known as 580 East 100 North to provide deeded access to county property known as 540 East 100 North. Thank Second. you, Evan. It's seconded by Kevin. Do I have any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Passes unanimously. Approving independent contractor agreement for redistricting consulting <laughs> services. Commissioner Walker. Okay, um, this, we discussed this at the last meeting and so this is the follow-up. Um, so I did ask three different redistricting consultants to submit bids um, and I got, got one response. Bill, Bill Cooper um, did not respond to the email. Um, the, the other response we got was for quite a bit more money, $15,000, which is higher than our budget and almost triple the MGGG bid. Um, so I, I think we should go with in, you know, MGGG. Um, I don't know how long you want. I mean, I, I can talk for quite a long time about redistricting, but I don't know that we have to do a lot of that. Right now, I, I, I am comp I think they are a solid group. They've got good software that fits our needs pretty well. They're willing to make customizations for us if we need it. Um, and they were sort of a, a pioneer in, in sort of identifying gerrymandered districts. So their their whole reason for existence is to construct fair legislative districts. So I, th I think they'll be a good partner doing this. Thank you for doing this work, Kevin and being so uh, that we're going to be ahead of the game, getting somebody to help us. Questions or a motion? Just, just out of curiosity, Kevin, what did the more expensive bid uh, offer that MGGG didn't, or did they offer anything? Um, I, didn't, I didn't notice anything, anything in particular off. I, I think it's, um, I don't know. The, the, the other consulting firm might be a little bit larger. I just thought it was a kind of a boilerplate proposition. Maybe, maybe didn't take into account that we were a pretty small county. I don't know. So, but, but yeah, the short answer to your question is I, I didn't notice anything significant that they were offering that MGG did not offer. And I, I did notice something, and there are some in the reverse, like we're probably gonna wanna go to a sub census block level to draw our districts. And that's, you know, not everybody has a technical capability to be able to, to do that. And MGGG assured us that they do, so. Right on. Well, with that, I will move to approve the independent contractor agreement for redistricting consult consultant services with MGGG lab contingent upon the receipt of certificates of insurance. Second. Motion by Jacques and seconded by Kevin. Discussion. I'm uh, glad we got these requests out. And uh, when I say we, I mean you, Kevin. Uh, <laughs> uh, good to do our due diligence to make sure that we're getting uh, the best bang for the buck with taxpayer money. So um, thanks for taking the time to, to do that. Yeah, I, I will just re remark that, um, yeah, I think redistricting is going to I was about to say, you know, take is going to go later than normal, but for Grand County, there is no normal. We've never done redistricting before because we, for some reason, we didn't do it in 2000 or 2010. Um, so, but we will need to think more about what kind of public process and public outreach we want to do. Um, so the, you know, I'm sure this will come up in, in future meetings. It's, but if you, if any of us know people who are interested in this question, you should encourage them to you know, to pay attention and make their thoughts known, et cetera. So, and I, I have, um, I've, I have spoken with um, local Republican leaders about, you know, encouraging them to get involved as well. And they've, they're conferring and they'll get back to us, so. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. We are to 
one uh, consent agenda, <laughs> ratifying the chair's signature on a contract with Streetlight Data Incorporated for Utah State University project to monitor trail usage in Grand County. Do I have a motion to accept the consent agenda? So moved. So moved, Evan, do I have a second? Jacques? I mean, maybe, yeah, no, we're, we're not supposed we're to have the consent agenda, but I was really curious about how, we, so they're using cell phone tracking cell phone to, track. to do, and does someone know more about this and could explain this to satisfy my curiosity? I agree. I, it's a pretty big, you know, it was 17,000. So yeah, I'd, I'd like to understand what, what we use it for was I breaking up the whole time it's uh, from what I was understanding is that it's it's going to be used to determine uh, usage and type of use of use boy I'm, I'm boy, echoing on uh, on uh, our trails in this area weird do you know how many trails that they're monitoring? Do, you, do we have any idea of that? So what type of trails they're monitoring? They're monitoring bike trails, hiking trails, ATV trails? All? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to search up Elaine's uh, email on this. Let me, I'll see if I can find it. She gave some explanation. but I need to look at my email. And, and to clarify, the cost incurred here is by Utah State University. And we're, this is just a user access agreement that we would be offering. Where am I? I'm on the wrong one. Anybody know if this is a time sensitive agreement? Yes, it is. That's why it's a ratify. Uh, Grand County, anything, correct? Our free, our, our uh, individual liberty. Yeah. <laughs> he says on the Zoom meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just Googled the company. It seems like they use smartphone data to track all kinds of transportation, which means that if you're not carrying your smartphone, they can't track you. And it does have the cu customer spelled out as Utah State, so. Um, yeah. But there is a thing that says cost $17,000. Does anyone know? It, and that's coming from uh, travel council funds, correct? Yes, I'm quite sure. That's why Elaine was involved in it. Okay. So I can't sorry. find the email. So I think I, you know, I can call Elaine and see if she answers the phone. Uh, hold on. And I don't know. I don't know. Echo. Um, but I could share my screen with the agreement pulled up, but I guess more importantly, I could try to read through and answer those questions as well. The agreement doesn't seem to, at least the one that was in the packet, doesn't really seem to outline, you know, exactly what they're doing. So um, the commission has some um, questions about this streetlight agreement. Um, can I just put you on speakerphone and then they can ask? So hold on a sec. All right, so go ahead and ask your questions. Elaine's on speakerphone. I think the main one might be, is this, is the fiscal impact, is the travel council paying for that or is it the University of Utah? 
Um, we, on the street light, we would be uh, paying part of that. We would, that would be our share along with the U Utah, uh, the university, uh, Utah State University. We were splitting the cost of it so that um, it's a joint effort so that we could work together on this project. And I believe they got grant funding, but we, we don't have grant funding for it. So is our cost 17200 or just half of that? No, it would be the 17200 for our share of, and then they would have their share. So we, we, we would each have a contract. We would have a contract with the streetlight, and then we would share the information. Okay, and then which uh, budget line item would you be cutting this to? Um, well, I, that's what my my question would be. I would, I could, if I could take it out of the uh, uh, promotional dollars, that I would take it out of that because that's where I've got a little more, whatever I've left, uh, wiggle room out of that because we would then be using that information that we're getting from the um, trails to market, uh, you know, whatever it might be, outfitters to market um, directly to that, inf those, you know, the, the information that we receive back from Streetlight would help us to know where the people are going, what, what trails they're using, where they go from one trail to the next trail, and then we should be able to pick up a lot more information that would allow us to use that in whatever way we see fit. Will this information be um, shared with other, other agencies in the area that might use it um, to, I don't know, with other, other people? Yes, yes. We're already working with Active Trails and Transportation. With We, we would involve the BLM, uh, all the land agencies. We have to meet with them, uh, and we've already had a conversation with Active Trails and Transportation because obviously the, they're limited in the amount of information that they have available, but they only have so many counters. But this would help to provide them with how many people are on trails, you know, when they're using the trails. So we've, uh, the uh, Professor Wayne Friedman already had a conversation uh, with Maddie, and we intend, we intend to use it, the information that we get collectively with um, all of the land agencies in the area so that it can help us to better understand what trails are being used the most, how people are using them, when they're using them, you know, all the, the granular information that we can gather from Streetlight. Is this, is this motorized and non-motorized trail? Pardon me, I couldn't understand. He asked, it, he asked if it was for motorized and non-motorized. Uh, no, this is, this would be more for right now, we were looking at the uh, the bike trails, but I'm not sure. We we probably could capture um, that information. Uh, I'm guessing, but I'm not sure if we could distinguish between who's on a bike and who's on a UTV if, or a dirt bike, or if they're using the same, if they're allowed to use the same trail. So I think. Um, because it's really going to be um, using uh, cell phone data that we are going to be able to capture. So I don't, I don't know if you can get down into the weeds as to what vehicle they're on, unless it's a specific trail. We would just be able to tell what usage, amount of usage is on the trail and the patterns of the trail users. Well, I'd be willing to make a motion now. Okay. Um, if you want a motion. Yes. Um, I move that we adopt the consent agenda as presented. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Do I have a second? Second by Sarah. Further discussion? Um, I, I, I present the motion, I guess I get to discuss first. I think this is an interesting program. 
By the way, I think the echo is going through Trisha. Yeah. Um, I, I think this is an interesting program. I'd be interested to hear more about it at the appropriate time, but I, I think based on what Elaine just said, I'm comfortable approving this. So. Excuse me? Hey, Mary, I think we already had a uh, motion by Evan. We did, Evan and Jacques made the motion. I, motion I by apologize. Jacques, I believe. I thought I made a mistake in my notes. Okay. I I would I obviously understand we already have a motion on the table. I would actually like to see more information before we sign something before we authorize these funds. I mean, I think we're just kind of like, oh, it's a we don't really know. Are they only monitoring four bike trails? Are they monitor monitoring everybody. I think the other thing we can agree upon is there's not a lot of cell service in a lot of these canyons. So obviously it'll give us data how many people are going down King Creek, but we don't, you know, once they get down there, we have no idea where they're going. Um, so I just think we're lacking quite a bit of information. The, uh, the understanding is that we will select uh, 50, I believe it's 50 locations each, like the university will select 50 and then we'll select 50 different spots. Uh, and it can be not only trails, it can be areas. We're going to, we, Wayne uh, and I had a conversation, Professor Friedman, we were going to discuss the all the areas, um, trailheads, we, we still have to map out um, all of the specific areas, but we, we want to meet with the land agencies first. Uh, you know, we're not just going to randomly just pick things. We want to be sure that we're meeting with Active Trails and Transportation, um, the BLM, so that we can identify where we want these points uh, to be to be able to monitor. So between with what the university because the contract is going to, well, two separate contracts with Streetlight, but we're going to be able to share the information uh, together and um, to help understand better where the, you know, traffic is going on, in, on trails, trailheads, and different points around Grand County. No, I appreciate that. I just kind of feel like we're putting the cart before the horse a little bit, like... Uh, couldn't we put all of the specifics in place, the contract in place, understand exactly what we're spending money on and then move forward? I, I guess if you want to do that, I can talk to the uh, to the professor and um, get to him and we can, I know that before Streetlight moves on uh, anything, they just need to have the contractual agreement signed. Nothing will be put into place until we sign, uh, my understanding is we sign with them that we're going to be working on this project with Streetlight, and then we start mapping out what we want to work on. But if you don't feel that it's right to sign off on that now, that that's, I don't think we'll just tell him to delay it and we'll push the project back. I, personally, I, I, I am comfortable moving ahead with this. I know there's a lot of unanswered questions, but some of these things do have to be worked out you know, with the consultant at a, a later date. Um, I, I do think Trisha's point about not all places in the county having cell coverage is important. And I hope that as when you identify you know, the polygons that you're gonna be monitoring, you take, take into account that some places might not have cell coverage or they might have cell coverages for some carriers, but not others. But right, right. But and when I we had that meeting with the BLM, uh, one of the main things that we talked about, besides uh, permitting uh, rally on the rocks, was uh, the concern over the the way the trails are being damaged in the backcountry. You know, the problems we're seeing with such an increase of visitation. Not, uh, and mostly the increase in visitations of U, uh, UTVs. And, uh, you know, they're willing to look at maybe at some point doing reservation systems so we don't get so many people down these trails that we have, uh, 
you know, that we could do maybe closing some trails to certain types of uh, vehicles or certain types of, you know, by, you know, uh, starting to separate user groups. And I know with the BLM, if we're going to do something like that, we have to have data because if they can, right. if they try to do I also, I also think, I also think with the um, effort being put forth with trail signage, and I, of course I'm, I'm not working on any of that, but uh, I would assume that that information that comes from the trail usage would be beneficial to know where to put the signage um, or where to erect the signs or whatever they're going to do. But I, I think that that would um, help tremendously um, to get at least have some idea of the amount of usage um, from this particular project. So I, I think when I spoke to the professor, I mean, we feel that this particular um, uh, opportunity to work with Streetlight, because they've been they've worked with other uh, areas of, in in the country, uh, to do sort of the same thing that we're doing to to look at the traffic patterns to see where you know people are are going. But I think it would really help us to know you know where do you put trail ambassadors that they're going to be putting out there? Where do you want to erect the signage and um, and how many signs do you need and what messaging are you going to put? Um, you know, on those trails. So I, I think it can be quite beneficial, but we're not going to um, be able to come to a immediate consensus on where um, those points uh, that we're going to assess will be because we, we have to sit down with, you know, active trails and transportation directors and the land agencies and sort of map out our strategy. And if a couple, I would imagine if a couple of uh, the commissioners want to be involved. I don't think that would be a problem where we all sit down and say, well, let's take a look at this point, that point, you know, so we can identify the, the key um, traffic areas that we think um, would be uh, important. I'll also just weigh in, I'm really comfortable paying for this other promotional funds. It's exactly the kind of programming work that I do think supports um, our promotional work. Well, you know, I'd define it more as, you know, the establishment of, of our recreational assets and programming. Um, this is the kind of information that we always want. Unfortunately, you can't get it for free. Um, but, you know, we don't, we're, we're running blind in a lot of cases on, you know, trying to figure out um, usage on various trails and so, you know, it's it's something that this kind of information that we've wanted for a long time. And so I think it would be pretty valuable for a lot of reasons. I, th I think the information is valuable. I'll just tell you, I've written a lot of grants for a lot of years. And anytime I ask for money, my budget is laid out and the specifics are laid out. And we're spending taxpayer dollars. That's all I'm saying. I obviously think there's value in the project. I just think that we should be apprised a little bit more of the specifics of what we're getting. You know, again, that's what you do when you're asking for money. It's uh, being paid for through TRT promotional tax money. And that's pretty limited on what we can use it on. There's very little we can use it on except for advertising and research and stuff like this. I so, will as an analogy, you know, we just approved an, a, con a contract with our redistricting consultants, and it's pretty general. It doesn't spell out exactly what they're going to do because we, at this point, we don't know. We're going to be deciding on the process that we do for redistricting, working with the consultants as, as we go along. So I, I think it's not totally unprecedented that something will be a little bit underspecified like this. I think it's information we need. Any further discussion? Okay, I'll call for a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 I couldn't, I'm gonna, I, so all opposed? Anyone opposed? 
Trisha has got her hand up. Okay, I can't see her. It's, it's she's, moved the, she's moved to the other side. Okay, there you are. I had it. I had that on the view where you had people all on one, and then it went back to. Okay, there you are. Okay, uh, so it passes. Was Trish the only opposition? Okay, so it passes six to one with Trisha Dean uh, voting in opposition. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, Elaine. Yeah. Sorry to bug you. Thank you very much. All right. Good night. Legislative update, Christina. Do we have anything else besides, uh, to talk about besides what we've already talked about? I don't really think so. I was planning to possibly prep some more bills, which I didn't do. But um, I, I think this could still be helpful if you guys have questions. I know there are some very controversial and important bills related to um, use of force for police and sheriffs agencies. There's of course the very controversial concealed permit bill that gets rid of that permit. Um, there's some good bills on mental health funding and the bill to fund 30 beds at the state hospital is back up and hopefully it passed this year um, subject to funding. So I don't know if, if you guys have any questions or anything. Otherwise, I didn't really get around to prepping this like I hoped. I know it's really important. It seems silly, but uh, periodically uh, to let your let our legislators, because we're not going to always agree with everything they do, but uh, it's good to maintain a decent relationship with them. So to text them or email them and say, uh, I, I recognize that you're working long hours and uh, this is a tough 45 days. Goes a long ways. I agree with that. So not just complaining, because then when you complain, they're more willing to hear it when they've heard from you in other manners. And the sooner you start creating a relationship with Hinkins, Watkin, and uh, Albrecht, the better off we are. I guess one, one other bill about ATVs that you might hear about is HB 111, and that's Carl Albrecht's bill. Um, and the intent of this bill was to allow kids to ride four wheelers on dirt roads, but the, it, he was revising a statute that existed pre 2015 when street legal ATVs were allowed. So the way the statute would, was written was very broad. And because a four wheeler is an ATV, um, it would have allowed kids to drive street legal ATVs on our city streets and roads. So that is an issue that um, I worked a lot on, Chris also worked on and um, it's, it goes to our legislative relationships. And I actually think they really like hearing from us, even though, um, you know, you might not think Carl Albrecht and, and Senator Hinkins and, and, and Representative Watkins identify with Grand County's constituents all the time. I think they do really enjoy um, hearing from us. I first contacted the OHB director of state parks who Carl Albrecht was working on with the bill about the change. He helped me refine it in a way that he thought Carl would appreciate in terms of the language. And then we took that to Carl Albrecht and he seemed very happy to make that amendment on the floor. So um, I think, you know, even that, you know, a technical change, just building those relationships with our legislators is important. And when they came to Moab, you know, uh, it was Hinkins and Watkins. They seem to really appreciate that. And um, I'll say Senator Hinkins is a great listener. I find him very respectful and um, very enjoyable as a person. And he is nice. Yeah. So I'm going to talk to him tomorrow and say, what, what about this bill for billboards? <laughs> We do and report back and then and maybe I'll contact him or not, depending on how that goes. So let me know. I, I need to follow up on the resolution for the UMP project. So I'll call him and follow up on that. And I'll say, you know, I'm, I don't like bills that take away municipalities and counties rights to govern their own counties and municipalities. So, OK. Anything else? It's getting late. Is that for me? Okay, just Discussion on encouraging better cooperation between Grand County, San Juan County, and Moab City for planning decisions which affect greater Spanish Valley. 
And we heard that tonight. Um, uh, Kevin and I were, go ahead, Kevin, start it. Okay, or, um, yeah, so the, the title sort of gives a brief, this brief discussion. As we know, Spanish Valley, you know, in, in a rational political map, it would all be, all have the same governing body, but in fact, we're split into three different pieces and that makes our planning and zoning results um, difficult. And some, sometimes people get frustrated with different rules between unincorporated Grand County and Moab City. And very frequently we, we, we worry that if we do some reform, it'll all come to naught because across, people can just go across the county line. But um, I think there is a lot more hope than there used to be. I think the current San Juan County Commission is very interested in, in doing what um, the Northern San Juan County residents want and they're interested in cooperation. Um, that was reiterated in a meeting that Mary and I had with them a few weeks ago. So I, I guess what I'm pro proposing here is that we try to put together um, you know, concretely, well, the, the general idea is we wanna put in place structures that will help us um, coordinate better on planning decisions. And the specific suggestions I have are one, we should try to craft some kind of joint resolution that just sort of gives the categories where we want to collaborate. For example, dark night skies, you know, it would not make sense for us to you know, eliminate all our upward pointing lights if in across the county line, there are lots of them. You know, we have, we've all got the same sky, so we need all need the same regulations to preserve the sky. Um, I think noise like aircraft noise is another great one, water. Um, I think we should also throw, throw cost sharing in there because that's something that's been brought up by Bruce Adams, for example, um, that you know sometimes an event that's benefiting Grand County economically is imposing cost burdens on San Juan County. So we wanna be sure to impress that. In any case, this, um, the joint resolution would be non-binding just to make it easier to pass. It would just be a statement of intent but then hopefully there will be specific things, for example, um, you know, revisions to land use code that, that would be easier to pass because they're part of, they come under this umbrella of an area that we wanna cooperate on. So that's the first suggestion. And this, the second one, which I'm a little less sure about, but it, it might be nice to have some kind of coordinating committee or discussion body where people from all three jurisdiction, jurisdictions get together and, and you know, at a minimum, let each other know what projects are coming down the pipeline so we don't get you know, surprised by something that's happening just across the county line. But it, they all, might also be able to make, you know, it, it's just sort of a way to discuss things, make suggestions for future changes, that, that kind of thing. Um, I think we need to think hard about what the membership of that committee would be um, and, and that could, you know, that could be resolved in future discussions. So. So those are the ideas I wanted to put on the table. I wanna see what the rest of you all think about that. And then if we're good with this, we can start having discussions with people from Moab City and San Juan County. I think what would be really good because we had that meeting, remember Evan, that joint meeting and everybody was there and it was going to, everything was going to go great. I think one of the first things we should do is decide on a day of the month and maybe bi-monthly or every three months have a joint, either count, uh, you know, county commission, uh, San Juan and uh, Grand County Commission meeting, so that it doesn't just go into the ozone, you know, that on the second Wednesday of the odd months, we meet from blah, blah, blah to blah, blah time. We'd have to coordinate it, but I don't, I think if we don't get that in place, we're going to end up in the same situation we were. Everybody go into it excited, but then there's never, you know, it dies, it stops. So I'd like to move forward. And if we wanted to do something like this, I think we should get, I, I know they want to do it. I mean, I, I don't know so much about Bruce, but I do know uh, Gray Eyes and Maraboy both really want to work close together. And I think Bruce does too. I've visited with him and if you, you know, he, he can come, you know, he, I think he wants, and he's always been good to us on the CIB. He supported our CIB stuff. So I think there's a lot of possibility there.
So do I guess do, do we want to move forward with this? Uh, with a regularly scheduled standing meeting. Yeah, about or every with resolution. Hmm? Uh, with uh, non-binding, uh, not a resolution, but what was the word you were using, Kevin? Um, a yeah, a, a non-binding joint resolution. Okay, mm -hmm. that one. Yeah, that thing. Uh, yeah, I'd I'd be interested in in something like that. Um, and uh, I think it probably does make sense. Um, if there was some sort of standing kind of thing, I know that uh, I know San Juan County has folks that kind of uh, keep tabs on on our meetings and our actions up here. So I don't know if it makes sense to have a, a staff position that, um, you know, kind of keeps a finger on the pulse in some of the other areas uh, or if it um, you know, if, if we can keep up with regular meetings at that, that outdoor meeting that you had mentioned before at, at OSTA, you know, there was, oh yeah, let's do this again soon. And um, we haven't done it since. And I let's think that, that uh, in terms of, of things to kind of have in that resolution, I, I think you're kind of on par there. Um, but then when it comes to things like cost sharing, I wonder if there should be some of the other players um that are straddling that line invited may uh, i don't know if that would be on this joint board or if it would be um uh, uh, individual meeting agenda but i think that as the as the valley has grown out there that um the moab valley fire department and uh, you know the ems and and folks like that are are responding and, and covering the duties of San Juan County a lot more than they were in the past. Um, I talked to Andy and he said that the way that the Utah uh, EMS and such are set up is they, they have a, like their, their boundaries go to Blue Hill or even beyond, I think to LaSalle, LaSalle Junction. One of you know, so that is part of the, the EMS is, part, is, is governed kind of by the state, where, what areas they cover. I think it's more uh, search and rescue and probably police. But I, we, those are things we have to find out. Yeah. Are we I'm, talking about involving the city as well? Yeah, no, de definitely involving the city as well. So, so then what I would propose to do next is just have, you know, a more detailed discussion with someone from the Moab City Council, someone maybe from the San Juan County Commission, and then we could have an, an initial draft of a resolution and some plan that can come back and there can be some comment. And then hopefully we can, you know, a few meetings from now have, have the final thing. And were you imagining the uh, the full commission or some representatives? For which part? Uh, I guess if, if we did have to, to Mary's suggestion of like a standing meeting, would that be, a, you know, something need to get noticed and minutes and the whole nine or would it? Um... I don't know. I, th I think that's something we can continue to discuss. Um, you know, I... I, I wonder, I think these joint meetings with like full commissions can be a lot of trouble and Mary's concern about, you know, losing momentum could be addressed by just having a more like a subcommittee or something yeah. like that composed of staff and some other people we appoint maybe that might be enough to keep things going and then they would report back. Great. So Kevin and I have been kind of working on this. Uh, does that, uh, wouldn't it be kind of nice to if there was another commissioner that would like to join us on I'd like I'd like to join you Mary. Okay. okay. So we'll we'll as a committee start getting things in place and uh, report back. Sounds good to me. Okay, Trish, Kevin, and Mary.
Okay, we all do. Calendar items. Sorry, Mary. Um, well, there's not a, a ton right now. I did hear earlier, it doesn't sound like um, a majority of the commissioners are planning to attend the February 9th uh, Thompson Springs Town Hall. Um, if that changes, please let me know because we'll need to notice that as a special meeting. Uh, otherwise, right now we have a, a kind of a potential special event of the Red Hot Marathon or maybe it's a half marathon for February 13th, um, but that's still pending because they need to resubmit their application for the COVID compliance uh, guidelines. But outside of that, um, that's all that I have for the immediate future. Thank you. Is that any questions for the calendar or special events? Okay, we are to uh, public hearing. We'll uh, open the public hearing. Public hearing to receive input from the public regarding the mental health and substance use disorder treatment needs in Grand County with such input from citizens, clients, and families to be used in planning services and in decision making during the next fiscal year. Karen. Hi, this is Karen Dolan. I can't tell if my camera is on or not. Um, I tried to turn it on. What's up? It's not on. Huh. I, well, I'll, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Karen Dolan with Four Corners. <clears throat> Belinda Hurst is here. She's our um, program director over Grand County Services. And Melissa Huntington is here, the clinical director of Four Corners. And so um, Utah state statute and Medicaid require us to have a yearly hearing just to get input on the planning and ideas for substance use disorder and mental health treatment services. And we use this input in our grant writing and our, in our planning. So I'm, we're here to hear feedback. Questions from the commission? Are there any members of the public that would like to speak? Any members? Are there Mallory? Um, no, we do have one, one client from Four Corners who has um, agreed to speak. Um, he's the one on the telephone, 1741. His name is Norman Turnipseed. Ter excuse me, and he um, has been a client at Four Corners and he was willing to talk about his experience. Okay, Nora, you'll have to hit star six to unmute yourself. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. I can hear you. Uh, my name is Norm. Uh, although I don't enjoy sharing my personal problems with strangers, uh, I feel this is very important. Uh, I'm almost 73 years old, and uh, I can say that Four Corners literally saved my life last fall. Uh, I had some uh, disturbing and traumatic events happen to me in Idaho. I was forced to leave my home. Uh, I bought a travel trailer and headed south, ended up in the upper uh, end of Castle Valley, camped out, and uh, I realized winter was coming, so I came to Moab to see if I could find some kind of work. I looked around for days and couldn't really find anything that fit uh, my capabilities and my age, and that was kind of depressing, so uh, I decided uh, I went back up to my travel trader one day to discover that a, a black bear had literally torn apart the front end of it. 
uh, he destroyed the refrigerator and a bunch of wiring and gas lines and stuff. So, uh, I was basically homeless. And so I came back to town to look for some kind of uh, temporary housing and didn't have any success there. So I ended up one night in a motel in Moab and I couldn't sleep and I paced up and down the floor and, uh, I finally, everything looked hopeless to me. And I need to say I'm not an alcoholic, nor am I a drug addict. And uh, I had some bad plans. I was going to take my own life. So I took a deep breath and said, well, what would a smart person do? So a smart person would seek help. So I went through the yellow pages. I found four corners. I called. Someone answered. And uh, she immediately said, I'm going to set you up with an emergency therapist, which she did. And she listened to my story and said, well, uh, I think I understand what's going on and we can be of help. So within a few days, I was talking to a therapist and it didn't take him long to figure out that I had a deep seated uh, fear of homelessness in addition to uh, depression. So we decided to do a three pronged approach, uh, cognitive therapy, medicine, and initially, more importantly, uh, he found a place for me to live. And so ever since then, it's been good for me. I've, uh, I follow the strategies, uh, uh, getting grounded was important to me. I, I think the medicine helped, but I need to stress that, uh, everybody, everyone who I've experienced at four corners has been an advocate for me. They express empathy, uh, and understanding. Uh, these are all things I don't think I would have gotten in my home state of Idaho. I really don't. Uh, as you probably know, depression is a, a very serious illness. The public's beginning to understand that. In fact, I'm sure whoever's listening to this conversation, if they haven't dis suffered depression themselves, and they certainly know someone who has. So uh, my, my life continues to get better and better based on the advocacy and uh, the professionalism at Four Corners. So whatever it is, uh, if this is a review or what, whatever it is, uh, can please continue to do it because these folks are, uh, know what they're doing and, uh, they're a, a valuable resource in your community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for having the courage to share. No problem. That was beautiful. I just want to say thank you on behalf of Four Corners for sharing that. It's, it's really nice to have positive feedback because our, our clinicians and our staff really are so dedicated to the human person in general. <laughs> so thank you so much for sharing that. Yes. Uh, and there's a stigma involved. It took me a while to get over it, but I don't care now. And I'm beginning to see more and more people suffer from this disease and uh, we can work with it, but, you know, we, we can overcome it. Thank you. Yeah. I've known many people through my time living in Moab uh, that have benefited greatly from four corners, mental health, the professionalism and the concern is, very well appreciated. And I know you've saved more lives than just norms. Amen. <laughs> Anyone else? Now, in the past, I, we need to sign something, but we're not here in person. So I, are you going to, I can go into the office tomorrow and sign it? Or if you have the ability to do electronic signatures, you can send it to me and I can do that. Okay, we will get it to you. Thank you. And uh, Mary, Melissa, Belinda, I'm so sorry. Um, Norm, thank you. That really, that was beautiful. Um, so I'm sorry to end it this way, but if possible, I remember last year, sorry, <laughs> uh, my puppy. 
a seven signature agreement and that was really hard during COVID to gather all of those signatures. So um, to help you all with your process, if we could have that be maybe the chair and vice chair, um, I, I think it would help us to help get you all the documents you need in a more timely manner because I think it was about two months ago that I, I got seven signatures. So I, I just think it would help us help you. Mallory, I think with this public hearing, we just need one signature. Okay. I think for other things, for the interlocal agreement, we had to have everybody, but I think with this, just the chair. So I'll get that to you. I, I wanted to say something. Uh, my, my mother passed away a year and a half ago. She was a clinical psychologist and she dedicated a good part of her practice to um, helping out indigent populations. She volunteered uh, her psychotherapy and um, I, I really appreciate what you guys do in this county. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And this is a public hearing that does not need to remain open for a week. So if we do not have any other people to comment, uh, I will close this public meeting. Mary, I actually had a, a couple oh. of questions that just, just for clarification. Okay. Um, and so, uh, Karen, maybe you can, we have a lot of new commission members, so uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, the county is is tasked by the state to provide um, mental health, uh, behavioral health services or support, and we contract uh, through Four Corners for for some of these. Uh, it's mainly the the Medicaid uh, portion of it. Am, am I correct in that? Yes. So by statute, the counties are the local authority to provide mental health and substance use disorder services to the safety net population. And so um, in 1972, the three, four counties got together and created Four Corners, <clears throat> excuse me, to provide the services to all four counties, including San Juan. And so I think in the early 80s, San Juan County dropped off. And then later 80s, Four Corners became private nonprofit so that they could apply for housing grants. Um, and so at, at this point, Four Corners is the, the county provider for all for Carbon Emory and Grand. We're the Medicaid provider. We also provide um, services to the indigent population as well. So, and we write lots of grants. So we have about 30 different contracts and grants. And so with those, those contracts, or could you just speak briefly about uh, relationships with other providers in the community, whether that's private or other public entities? So we serve um, Medicaid primarily and Medicare. We have several grants for folks that don't have any insurance. We have a sliding scale for people who are, you know, the, the working working class. Um, we accept a couple of insurances. We don't compete with private providers. So many private providers in our communities um, do their own billing of insurance or have uh, people that can afford it, you know, can, can go to private providers. We, we um, is this kind of what you want to know? <laughs> yeah, just, yeah, okay. so I, I, I know that, uh, or I know that there is some resource sharing, like with, uh, Moab Regional Hospital and, and things like that. And yeah. um, I, I guess if there's, if there was other people listening in on the hearing, I guess I was more kind of like, what, what are all our options within the county? So okay. Could, so, yeah. so we have two drug courts that we provide treatment for um, a family drug court and a high risk drug court. It used to be called the felony drug court, but it's high risk. We also wrote for a grant to share some of Dr. Press time with Moab Regional Hospital to do a substance use disorder clinic. And we, um, she's wonderful. She's a psychiatrist an addiction certified psychiatrist. So we're doing a substance use disorder clinic at um, Four Corners while well, it's been COVID. So partially remotely and partially in person. 
Um, but we're, we wrote a grant to purchase some of Dr. Press time. Um, and we have wonderful qualified licensed providers that provide really quality care. Under Melissa's supervision, we've moved to only evidence-based treatments. Um, therapy used to be kind of art, you know, you could kind of create your own art. And now we've found that there are really specific treatment modalities that make a difference. And we don't want to waste anyone's time or their life with things that aren't proven scientifically to work. So we train our, our clinicians. Um, so they're providing services that are really kind of zeroed in on, on effective outcomes. Great. Now that that's uh, helpful for sure. It's, it's a, uh a great service that uh, you provide for sure. And I know people have taken advantage of the clubhouse and, and um, you know, definitely uh, I'm glad you're here as part of this uh, web of uh, mental health and physical health and everything that we have um, here. So thanks for that. Another thing we provide is 24 hour crisis services. So we provide that to anyone and everyone. If they're having a mental health emergency, we will be there for them. We help with civil commitments, helping people get up to the hospital if they need that or creating safety plans. And that's for all, all residents that are having a mental health emergency. We have a lot of housing in Grand County. Um, for our folks with serious and persistent mental illness and, and also our clubhouse for folks that are struggling. You're, are you trying to talk to Mary? You're muted. Mary, you're muted. I'm muted. Oh, I haven't done that much tonight. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. Any other commissioners have any questions? Okay, I will close this public meeting. Uh, Christina, do we need a closed session? Uh, I don't think so. There was oh. something else I proposed by email, but I can't remember what it was, so I don't think so. Okay, it's been a long, long Long meeting, I just misplaced. So I think we have hit, we are at the end of our agenda, correct? I just, so I will uh, adjourn this meeting of the Grand County Commission if no one objects. Meeting adjourned. Meeting Thank adjourned. You. Thank you. Thank you.